I'm Ildiko Shoshani. I'm an actor, writer, and filmmaker, and you're listening to Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to Neil Before Pod, the podcast that has almost survived another year. I'm your host Craig and we're here to discuss the news, trailers and what sits from the month of December 2023. As you're listening to this, it is after the 1st of January 2024, so I guess Happy New Year. My guest will also get a Happy New Year. Hello Chris, Happy New Year, even though it's still this year. Happy New Year Craig, even though it's still this year. I mean, it's always still this year, isn't it? Whatever year you're in, it's always still that year. Well, Happy New Year for next year, or the year after, or the year before, depending on when you're listening to this. Because you'll listen to this this year, so that it's published for next year. Yes. There you go. All bases covered. But listeners, you're always listening to it this year. Whatever year that may be, Yeah, you're always listening to it this year. There you go. Some technical accuracies to round out the, the year, or start the year. You decide. Or finish the year. Depending on when you're listening to this. Yes. Happy year. Happy year, yes. But yeah, December, we did that. Christmas is over for another year. That long build up to a very short period of time is over. Tell the listeners if you had a good festive period or not. Yeah, yeah, it was a good festive period. We spent with family and friends and stuff. Kind of got my festive on towards the end of December. Wasn't feeling particularly festive rolling into it, but definitely did on the way out. So yeah, I had a nice Christmas period. So the screening of Jingle All The Way didn't heighten your festiveness. (laughs) I mean, it kicked off a bit of festiveness. Added into the mix some festiveness. Got there in the end. Mine was good too. It was good fun. And like I say, done and dusted for another year. There's that Simpsons joke about Love Day where they spend all this time and money on decorations that they then throw out at the end of the day. It almost feels like that, doesn't it? Definitely. Definitely. All the wrapping paper. Yeah, I spent... Well, I never wrap things because I'm horrible at it. The years that I attempted to wrap stuff, it was always a disaster. So I just don't do it anymore. But yes, it's that I spent hours wrapping this stuff and you spent seconds tearing it apart. Fantastic. (laughs) Into the recycling with that then. Yeah, thankfully I don't have too many people to rap for. Every once in a while I do something really well and it's a bit of a fluke. And then after that everything looks just rubbish. If it's not in a perfect box, then it's a challenge. Oh, I don't know. I, I somehow manage even to screw up the perfect box. So. <laughs> oh, I always screw up. I just keep putting sellotape on until it somehow hangs together. That's usually <laughs> my plan. But I don't do it anymore, really, so... That's that. You know, those sort of packages that they warn you about, if you see them in the mailroom, that you're not supposed to open them because there's loose wiring sticking out and some sort of fluid leaking from them. Now, that's pretty much every Christmas present I wrap. Yeah, it's pretty much mine as well. Suspicious package. No, no, mm. just Craig wrapped it. It's fine. <laughs> but December also had some news and stuff, so we'll get to that. First of all, we'll get to our usual been watchings. So what have you been watching? What's been in front of your face for the last month or so? Oh, for the last month or so has been... Be, let me think. For All Mankind is probably my regular watch at the moment on Apple TV. I've been enjoying the recent season. It's not not at its peak, but I'm still enjoying it. It's still got some good stuff going on. Just a really interesting sort of what-if spin. They're getting closer and closer to the present day as every season goes on, so it's, it's sort of interesting seeing all the different developments, all the things that have sort of spun differently in the timeline and For All Mankind. Based on the trajectory of the technology advancing that I saw in season one, do they have warp drive by now then? <laughs> I mean, they're probably not far off of warp drive at this point. There's still a bit of limitation and everything in there. But I know there was like a moon base at the end of season one and stuff like that. So I can only imagine that by the year 2000, they can travel faster than light. And at this point, they're on Mars and they're starting the Mars colony. Is that it? Really slowed down. Yeah, they've slowed the pace right down. It's it's interesting. It's just interesting to watch. I've, I've been enjoying that one. What else? I've watched the beginning of the latest season of Invincible. That has been on Amazon. Enjoying watching a little bit of that. That's been about it, actually. I think as far as regular TV watching has been. I'm trying to think of what else. I think everything else is kind of finished and has probably already been discussed on other episodes by now. Yeah, maybe. Movies? Been watching any of those? I know for a fact that you've watched some, because I was there. (laughs) You're going to end up reminding me of all the movies. Don't worry, they're all on my list, perhaps. 
all on your list and I'll go, oh yeah, I saw that one. Movies. Well, obviously we did a retrospective of Jingle All The Way that you hinted at at the beginning of the episode to try and get our festive on. First time I'd seen that on the big screen. So really enjoyed going off and seeing that. Arnie on fine form, comedy form. And very, 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 very recently uh, we went to see uh, Aquaman. Yes. Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Considering how much money it made, this was obviously Aquaman 6 that was out by... Oh, no, 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 wait, sorry, hang on. It was Aquaman 2. It was a follow-up to 1999's Aquaman. (laughs) Feels like it. It was so long ago, I was like, I regret not reminding myself of what happened in the first Aquaman when I was watching it. It was all right in my book, Aquaman. There you go. Chris's rating, it was all right. I would say a nailed on, if I was having to put arbitrary star markings against Aquaman, it would be two stars for me. It ticks every single box and exceeds in none of the boxes whatsoever. (laughs) So if you want something that is, in fact, a movie, Aquaman is a Movie. The first film was every movie. They just threw everything in. Yes. <laughs> it was so much movie. Yeah. But this one was just kind of a movie. I did enjoy it, but reflecting on it, I'm thinking that it should have been about the buddy thing with him and Patrick Wilson, but that's just kind of part of it. They don't really do an awful lot with it, but what was there was actually pretty good. I like the way they bounced off each other and the way that developed, but that feels like your film. I mean, they had all the mm. rest of the stuff. And then Manta was just there he was a generic villain that should have been way better than he was and there wasn't really any standout sequences that i can remember now after only seeing it like a week ago yeah that was kind of my problem i I came away and i was like well it did stuff but there was nothing that gripped me in such a way that was like wow i want more of that i can't believe that that's momoa's potential last outing on this Oh, definitely his last outing on this. Definitely his last outing. Is this it? Is this it all done? Yeah, okay, I guess. And that's how it goes out. It was kind of a bit of a shame, especially because it's been building up for so long. It's had so much rework and redone this and redid that and edited in six different Batman and then edited out three different Batman and then maybe, I don't know, added a seventh Batman and then decided to have no Batman, whatever they did. All this sort of stuff that they've done to it. By the time you get there, you go, okay, is that it? I guess. Okay. And the DCU, such as it was, is now over. There was a lot of stuff like Momoa, I think, was great, but has been really unlucky with how everything's tied together in the end, really. Every once in a while, they would put in a joke, dude bro kind of moment for him, but it was kind of like they hit a timer and they went, oh, it's been 15 minutes since we got him to do a dude bro moment. Let's paste one into the script here. And they would just slap it in. And then it would be another 15 minutes and they go, oh God, we've not done it. Oh, we've been doing plot and story and stuff. We better do another joke, quick. There's a joke, put it in, done. And there was a few music needle drops and I didn't think any of them particularly worked well. <laughs> it was like they went, needle drops work in these movies now, don't they? Putting well-known songs and in, we'll do a song, put a song in this bit. Okay. You mean you weren't keen on the Born to be Wild thing that kept coming up? They just dropped tunes in and went these are recognisable you like that stuff don't you it's like the painting by numbers we've ticked the music needle drop box that people like so we've done it right we did everything that you love you might like all those different things but you might not necessarily like them all in the same bowl (laughs) we heard you like mac and cheese and ice cream we've put them on the same dish that looks disgusting but since they'll never find another actor that people will take seriously as Aquaman we will never see Aquaman in live action probably ever again oh I think they'll be able to find someone to play Aquaman They'll be able to find someone to play him, but someone that people wouldn't laugh at? That's a different story. <laughs> they wouldn't laugh at as Aquaman. No, but maybe you want someone to laugh at your Aquaman. Hmm. I don't know. How about you, Craig? What have you been watching and enjoying? What have I been watching? Well, TV has been a bit light, actually. I'm still slowly continuing my watch of Riverdale, which is still insane, still loving it. But it's just something that I put on whenever I find the time to just, you know, I'll put one of these on. So it's it's going very slowly. In terms of new stuff, I've been watching the new series of What If, which is dropping at one a day for nine days. So there's been a number of them by now. I've only watched two of them, though. The first one, which was What If Nebula Joined the Nova Corps? A question that was on everyone's lips, I know, but they answered it. I wasn't keen on that one. And I watched the What If Happy Hogan Did Die Hard? It's actually What If Happy Hogan Saved Christmas, but What If Happy Hogan Did Die Hard? It's Die Hard with Marvel trimmings, really. And it was quite fun, but I haven't watched any of the other ones. 
So my appraisal of what I've seen of what if is one I didn't like and one I did like. The next one will tip the scales in one direction or another. What if Craig watches a third one? Will he love it or will he hate it? Find out. I will watch a third one, but I haven't felt compelled to sit and watch it. And putting stuff on every day, it's like, I need to find time for this every day. <laughs> I know it's only half an hour, but effort. Hang on. Are you complaining that there's Marvel content every day? I want to introduce you to past Craig. <laughs> Just see how that conversation would go. I have not even watched one of them yet. I've not got around to it. I've not done it. I might remember at some point and give it a watch. You can have a nine episode binge at some point if you want. Yeah, nine episode binge. Woo. At some point. By the time you're listening to this, I think they'll all be out. Count down to the bells and then they'll all be released. If you start the last What If episode at 30 minutes to midnight, something will happen. Bang on midnight. You know, one of those challenges. <laughs> The other thing's Doctor Who, the four episodes that we've now had. Three David Tennant, one Shooty Gatwa. In general, I enjoyed it. I liked the first David Tennant special, fine. The second one I thought was really good. The third one I wasn't keen on. Then the Christmas special was Shooty Gatwa. I thought he was good, and I think the new companion's really good. But I found the episode itself pretty average. Oh, but it had a Goblin King song. Yeah, but the goblins were just nothing. And you got to see Davina McCall taken out by a Christmas tree. Or possibly not taken out by a Christmas tree. Spoilers, man. Spoilers. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. I'm not going to say. What more could you ask for? I love that this is a collaboration with America now, with American money in it, and we've got worldwide superstar Davina McCall getting taken out by a Christmas tree. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad to see that the money has not went to the producers' heads and they've went too over budget with the random celebrity cameo. Well, back in Doctor Who's heyday, when it was popular in the US as well, they must have had a lot of British known comedians and things in the oh, show yeah. that people were like, who the hell is this? Of course. Well, did you think I was being sarcastic when I said worldwide superstar Davina McCall? <laughs> Come on, Craig. As if. I don't know. Maybe she presented Big Brother in the US. I don't know. I've never watched Big Brother. As if I would knock worldwide superstar Davina McCall. <laughs> don't know what you're getting at there, mate. I was going to say, they had Anne Robinson and people like that, but she did the <laughs> weakest link in the US for a while, didn't she? Yeah. I kind of feel similar about the episode I, I watched the Christmas special last night. I thought it was okay. It always takes me a while to bed in with new doctors. I don't like change. <laughs> it takes me a little while to get in. I'm interested. It is a completely different kind of energy, I think. Yeah, it definitely is. Seeing the little teaser that they've put out as well, you sort of get that it's going to be a different kind of energy, I think. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. One of the things that threw me during the episode was the new assistant or companion. I keep wanting to call her Millie, but that's the actress name. Ruby is the, the character's name. She takes it all massively in her stride. There wasn't any moment of, what is going on? What is this crazy stuff that I'm involved in? It's a bit where the doctor starts singing and then she just joins in without even questioning why she's doing it. No, no. The companion's supposed to be the audience analogue. This normal person flung into this extraordinary world and she's just in there and involved and not questioning anything. <laughs> but she's she's really good. The actress is only 19. To make everybody feel old, she wasn't even born when Billy Piper was cast. And she was like one year old when the show first aired, as in the, the modern version of the show with Christopher Eccleston. Oh, that's ridiculous. Yep. But she's really good. I'm not saying that 19-year-olds can't be good actors, but it was really surprising how confident and assured she seemed in the role already. So yeah, I think it's going to be a fun pairing for the, the next series, which is on in May, I believe, and it will consist of eight episodes, and then there'll be another Christmas special come Christmas. So we're back to semi-regular Doctor Who for a while. Whether you can be excited by that or not, I don't know. The five-month gap will be a thing, though, won't it? Oh, I saw a Christmas special, now five months pass. Oh, yeah, that's a thing I need to watch in five <laughs> months. I'm sure there'll be more trailers and excitement and build-up and whatnot that will be rolled out. But yeah, we've kind of went through that rush of, what, four episodes pretty much back-to-back? -back. Yeah. Or maybe the BBC will do what they sometimes do, and it's, oh, by the way, this is on next week. <laughs> oh, okay. But I don't, I don't think Disney will let that happen. It's like, surprise, Doctor Who. So next week, clear your calendars. <laughs> there will be no screeners sent out to Craig's. Or not this Craig, anyway. On to films. The only new Christmas thing I watched was It's a Wonderful Knife, which is It's a Wonderful Life by a slasher movie. And it was not that great, to be honest. The most clever thing about it was the title. It was just kind of average. The slasher stuff was boring. The It's a Wonderful Life side of it was boring. It would have been better if Bloomhouse had made it, probably, because they excel at that sort of genre mashing. But it's a shudder thing. Not that they don't make good stuff, but I think in this case they really didn't. So it's not getting added to the Christmas classic watch list, unfortunately. 
Oh. I didn't get around to watching that John Woo film, Silent Night, or whatever it was called. It's a Christmas action movie directed by John Woo, but I didn't get around to watching it. Next year, the moment's gone now. I saw Godzilla Minus One, which is the latest Japanese Godzilla movie, made on a fraction of the budget of one of the American Godzilla movies. And it was really good. It frames Godzilla as PTSD, because in the Godzilla movies, the monster always represents something, whether that be the fallout of World War II or fear of nuclear obliteration, that kind of stuff. And I think in the American one, the most recent American one, in the first film, he was conceptualized as a natural disaster, like a hurricane, as in it's this thing that you just have to get out of the way of. But this, it was PTSD, which was an interesting angle for it. Budget-wise, it's pennies compared to what they're spending on the, the American ones, which we'll perhaps talk a bit about later. Perhaps. But it looks incredible. When you consider the budget, it's like, wow, what they've pulled off here is amazing. And it was a good story, and it was very watchable. The couple that were talking the whole way through it when I was in the cinema didn't like them, but I liked the movie. <laughs> so if you're into your Japanese monster movies, that's one of the better ones. I saw Wonka, which I thought was fine. As a musical, it doesn't have any songs that I even remember. It's even funnier watching it through the lens of knowing that Hugh Grant hated every minute of what he was having to do. Oh, really? Yeah, he talked quite candidly about how filming as an Oompa Loompa was just an utter nightmare. So when you watch Hugh Grant in it and you think, he hates everything he's doing. So that adds an extra layer of hilarity to the proceedings, I guess. Timothy Chalamet was okay in the role. He didn't have the psychotic edge that Gene Wilder or even Johnny Depp had that I think the character needs. Because he is a, just a complete nutcase who makes chocolate. So he doesn't have that. Although I think it's a different take that strips that away. But at the same time, it's, why are you making it then if you're stripping away something definitive about the character? But it was fine. I wouldn't go out of my way to see it again, but it was okay. Would have been better if there was a song that I could actually remember in there. We've had enough of these origin movies. We don't need them. <laughs> Speaking of origin movies, so The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, and you were at that. I was at that one, yeah. I kind of forgot about that one. I kind of enjoyed that. I thought it was interesting. It's sort of a different than some of the villain prequel stuff that you see where it tries to go overly sympathetic. It does try and go for Snow's point of view for a bit and try and come up with a bit of reasoning and you see some paths that could have been followed. So I thought that was interesting. I didn't get tons out of it because I've never been the hugest of Hunger Games fans, but I imagine a few people that are will get more out of it maybe than I did, but I enjoyed it for what it was. Yeah, I thought it was decent enough. I think it's weirdly too long, but also too rushed. Mm. The film feels long, but it also feels like it doesn't do enough to tell its story so you have a point in snow's development where he's kind of a nice guy and then now he's evil <laughs> and the in-between part you don't really get a good look at i'm not advocating for splitting things in two but maybe this one should have been split in two yeah there's kind of a rapid tonal shift part way through and they made a decision just to stick it all in one film would i have advocated for splitting it well, it was the right decision because people barely watched this one so they're probably not going to watch two of them yeah, I think the problem was if you went for the split, you probably wouldn't have enough content for your first film. Well, I think the first film would naturally end when The Hunger Games ends. Yeah. And then the second one is the aftermath of that. Yeah, but like I say, I, I don't think you would have enough, like if you'd stretched out the first part to make it modern day ridiculous film length, I think you would have struggled to retain for people coming back for the next one. You would have ended up with a part one without a part two. Maybe, yeah. You would have needed the studio to basically have committed to film both of them back to back right away so that they didn't have the chance to write off the <laughs> second one. Otherwise, you'd just get left with part of a story, I think. So yeah, they probably did the right thing, but they could have done something with the pacing or fills in a few blanks and cut out some other bits, possibly. The build up to The Hunger Games was the part that felt, or one of the parts that felt rushed for me as well. Mostly because you don't get to know who most of the competitors are, which is of course by design, but then you get to the stage where they're starting the games and I'm thinking, oh God, we're here already. Because I was expecting <laughs> it to be the climax of the film and it was, I don't know, an hour and a bit in or something like that. And then you have this whole other film that plays out very quickly afterwards as well. So that's your natural split point, but box office wise, I don't think audiences would have put up with it. Unless, as you say, they committed to, we're doing this in two parts, but we'll film it all together. 
Yeah, I felt the last sort of 30 minutes of this, I was like, oh, and, th- and this is where it's going to close, right? And I was like, <laughs> oh, there's more film. Oh, okay, okay. And then you go, okay, this is where it's going to close, and they're going to roll the crit. No, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so that was that. Aaron hated it, though, in case anybody wants to know. Aaron really hated it. <laughs> Another thing I saw was Wish, which I thought was okay. If it's the signature Disney 100-year celebration film, then I don't think it's quite up to that level. But it was fine. It does have a memorable song. So there we go. I still remember at least the main song, the Selling Point song. So that's something in its favour. When I saw it, I got invited to a preview screening, which it turned out was a family screening run by this company in the UK called Show Film First. But there was people on the guest list and I was one of them. Turns out I was the only one there without a child. So that was exciting to walk into. Me, this weird guy that came to see this Disney film by himself, surrounded by a bunch of parents. Just a very awkward scenario. I did get a free pastry though, so... That's worth it, isn't it? He also got his face painted. I did not get my face painted. I could have. Totally got his face painted. I might have been hauled away if I'd walked up and said, can I be painted as a tiger or whatever? No, I think you should leave. (laughs) So I just watched the film and left, but I enjoyed it for the most part. Again, not the biggest Disney centenary thing that you could ask for. I think it was probably something they were making anyway that ended up being retooled as this could just be our centenary celebration. And then... It comes out. Will it be a memorable? Kids will love this forever, probably, because you get them at a formative age and they'll just love it. But yeah, I liked it. The next three films, or last three films, I saw them all today, actually. I did a triple bill at the cinema, which I haven't done in a while, but I timed it almost perfectly. Basically walked out of each film and into the next one and it wasn't far off starting. I love it when that happens, especially when it means you miss most of the adverts. But the first thing I saw was Anyone But You, which is a Sydney Sweeney Glenn Powell rom-com. I thought it was a bit of a slog, to be honest. So much of the film rides on the fact that the two characters don't like each other, and I never bought that for a second. There was all the banter sniping and whatever, and it just didn't really work for me. There was moments of sincerity towards the end that I thought landed a bit better, but on the whole, I thought it was a bit of a slog. Definitely not for me. It's a couple of pretty people in a gorgeous location trying to pretend they don't like each other. So if that's your jam, then there might be something in it for you. But I think the actors involved are all better than that. So don't rush out to see it. I saw Next Goal Wins, which is Taika Waititi's latest film that doesn't have Thor in it. And it was all right. I think he's quite good at these quirky underdog stories. Michael Fassbender was really good. It's good to see him in a film that I didn't despise for a change. It's been a while. Usually he's in films that aren't very good. It's funny in places. There's a heartfelt moment at the end that landed for me as well. So yeah, it was okay. I enjoyed it. And Ferrari was the last one that was fine. Adam Driver was really good. The story was too much, actually. There was too much going on. And trying to figure out what the film was actually about was a bit of a challenge in some places because it was focusing on too many different things. Also, Shailene Woodley needs to get out of this rut of being the thankless spouse character because that's the third time she's done that in a row, as far as I'm concerned, in in terms of what I've seen her in. So she needs to stop that because she's way better than that. Yeah, Ferrari's fine. The racing was really cool. It was okay. Any of those interest you? I've been seeing a few trailers and stuff for the Ferrari film, so I've got some interest in that potentially. Chances are I probably won't get the chance to see them now, but when they come out on demand or uh, available for download, I might give them a watch. You'll find some other reason not to watch them. <laughs> I could watch those or... Or re-watch something I've watched a hundred times. Yep. That's exactly it. That's it for films for me, really. Do you have anything to plug? We plug things in this section. You plug things? Okay, things to plug. I am on the radio on Sundays on Black Diamond FM in Midlothian, which is available online, blackdiamondfm.com, Sundays 12 until 2. I also appear infrequently, but on many episodes of Lave Radio, which talks about Elite Dangerous and the community that surrounds it, which you can find at laveradio.com. Cool. That's succinct. That's where you can be found. And on other episodes of this podcast, perhaps. Occasionally, from time to time. Yes. My plugs are a couple of interviews. They were recently released. My interview with a writer on a show called Virgin River, a show I've never watched. Ildiko Sushani, her name is, and she was really cool to talk to. She also directed a film that she wrote as well and talked a lot about that. I interviewed Rick Cosnett, who was in The Flash, and I learned when I interviewed him that he's from Australia, which I didn't know before. That was an interesting thing to find out. Really cool to talk to. Didn't have long with him, but got a lot out of him in those 12 minutes I think it ended up as. So give those a listen. Upcoming, I have an interview with Dr. Phlox himself, John Billingsley. He's promoting this charity event that's coming up pretty soon, and he talked about that plus other aspects of his career. Great conversation with a guy. He has no filter. He just 
opened up about everything that I asked him about, just kept nothing back. It's the kind of interview you want, really. Just someone that just is there to chat and has a lot to say. So that'll be coming up soon. So if you like Star Trek Enterprise and other stuff that he's been in, and he's been in a lot, chances are you've seen something that he's been in because he's done that much. You'll hopefully enjoy listening to him. I've also appeared, will have appeared by the time this releases, but haven't appeared yet on the TARDIS crew discussing the Doctor Who Christmas special. That'll be linked in the show notes. You can listen to that. But I haven't done it yet. So I don't know what it was like, but that's over in the We Made This Podcast Network where I also crop up. So you can go there and hear me talk even more if you really want to. So before we get to trailers, I do want to issue a massive thank you to Superfan Violet for a very generous donation that will help keep the lights on at this podcast for a little while longer. So if you hate listening to us, then first question is why are you listening to us? Tough. We're sticking around because someone has paid to help us do that. And if you like listening to us, then good news. Someone's paid to help keep us on the air. So yay. A very sincere thank you, Violet, from everybody. And I'm sure, Chris, you'll echo that sentiment. 100%. It was a highlight of our Christmas do to be told about the donation. So thank you very much, Violet. Much appreciated. Yes. And the free drink that some people were able to get as a result of that donation went down very well. She's already been told about this, but I'll confirm it on air. She also gets to select a topic and its panellists as a thank you. So we sleep in fear waiting for that to happen. Everyone's thinking, will she pick me? And what will it be about? I know you are. I know every day you're like, oh God, what if it's me talking about, I don't know, something that you hate. (laughs) She makes you talk about the last season of The Flash or something. As someone that hasn't watched it, I wouldn't be a great contributor on the final season of The Flash. But part of the mandate would be that you'd have to watch everything that you haven't seen in order to comment. That's an even more significant donation. (laughs) (laughs) There's not enough money in the world, perhaps. (laughs) That's a costly donation, that one. (laughs) Yeah, so Violet, if you want to hear that, get your checkbook out. Or anyone else, really, if anybody else wants to get their checkbook out. and I know, I don't want this crowdfunded. I'm I'm saying the goal's too low. No, 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 no. no. So when you set those petitions and it's, you've got to get 3,000 signatures of the petition for anything to happen and then suddenly everyone clubs together with a penny and I'm having to watch the final season of The Flash. No, 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 no. It's like that guy that did a Kickstarter so that he could make potato salad and then he got a donation of like hundreds of thousands or something like that. So it kind of backfired because all he can do is spend that money on making potato salad. <laughs> Unless he's some other crooked crowd funders that we could mention who spend the money on themselves somehow. And apparently no action is taken. But for legal reasons, we won't name any of them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's move on to trailers. We have a number of those. Let's start off with one for a TV show. We have a couple of Amazon things first up, actually. But the first one is The Boys Season 4. We have a teaser for that. Homelander continuing to cause trouble and so on. What did you think of the teaser for The Boys Season 4? It's the beginning of the dystopian trend that we've got running through all the trailers this week. Or this month, I should say. I thought it was okay trailer-wise. I got kind of what I was expecting for a Boys trailer, to be honest. At the end of the last season, I had kind of had enough. I think they went a bit too far slightly in the last season. I don't think they're particularly going to hold back this season either. This hasn't done anything to put me off, which is good, I guess. We're seeing the presidential race taking place. We're seeing a bit of division between the two different sides of the argument. I'm not too sure what really to expect this season. They've set up potential deaths and different things that could happen. Glad to see the octopus is back. (laughs) Excellent news. It does feel like the boys is building to a natural end point. It really felt like that at the end of season three, where there was a lot of point of no return revelations. Mm. I guess there is no such thing as a true point of no return in a universe like this, but it does feel like we're crossing into territory where it's not easy to come back from. It does always have a natural end point anyway, as in having these superpowered people around is not a good thing. We need to put an end to this somehow. So it does feel like there'd be a natural conclusion anyway. Otherwise it would just be, oh yeah, this continues to be awful. Isn't that great? Just like the real (laughs) world continues to be awful. Love it. Indeed. It turns out with a heavy marketing budget, you can get away with anything. But Homelander is, I think, one of TV's greatest villains in general. I think he's so good and Anthony Starr is, is so good at playing him. We get to see a bit of Starlight being a literal beacon for people which will be interesting. Jeffrey Dean Morgan's in this show. That's always good to see. I like Jeffrey Dean Morgan. I think he's playing Butcher's dad, by the looks of things. Well, maybe not. Maybe just someone he knows. But anyway, he's, he's in there. 
It's funny because you had Jensen Ackles last season, who's Jeffrey Dean Morgan's son in Supernatural. So, bit of a connection there. But it's also an Eric Kripke show, so you see the actors recycled from things that he's worked on before as well. So, it's not really a surprise. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. I've said about the boys before, it's very extreme, but it also has enough to keep me interested, as in, isn't that every character's irredeemably awful there's a couple of people that you can look at and think i quite like this person they seem okay as people and i think that's something that the gen v spin-off misses to some degree i'm i'm not hugely invested in any of the characters and that i did start it but i haven't finished it mm. it just seemed to be the boys but without any of the safety pins i suppose any of the trappings that tell me that the world isn't completely doomed yeah that's kind of one of the things from the boys that there's a few characters that you can kind of root for but many of them still make awful decisions even the ones that you're particularly rooting for yeah i mean they're people that's fine yeah but sometimes it's nice to have a little beacon in amongst a lot of brutality nastiness and terrible decision making to go oh i can kind of get behind you and then characters can disappoint you characters can redeem themselves that is how story arcs work i get it but there's not a lot of redemption on the go no there there isn't so we'll see how this goes i will continue watching it i don't know if this will end up being the last season the brand if we can call it that that's what it is now isn't it? brands and content and all this stuff mm. the brand is popular so i think they'll keep the boys universe on the go in some way but the boys show might have to naturally come to an end at one point there's avenues that they can go down and spin offs and things characters that live through it i guess can spin off into their own stuff and whatever nothing lasts forever and i really hate it when they keep shows around forever when they just do not need to be around forever as well quit while you're ahead in some ways is a good idea yeah no one ever wants to be the final season of the flash no or anything after the third season <laughs> oh god when's this gonna finish it finished like a year ago and we're still kicking it yep moving on still at amazon the fallout adaptation of the video games i'm not really into games like that so i'm aware of the fallout games and i've even played a little bit of them but i'm not someone that will ever get really stuck into something like that it looks authentic to the games the cast is great. The Westworld showrunners running it, so that'll perhaps be a good thing from your perspective. Maybe not. I don't know. Jonathan Nolan, he's involved. So certainly from a capturing the fan base point of view, it looks like they've reproduced what people would expect at least. Yeah, I've played a few of the Fallout games. They've kept the soundtrack, the 50s, 60s aesthetic soundtrack stuff going on, at least from the trailer point of view. The interior of the vault scenes seem quite true to what I've seen in the games. You've got a bit of power armor going on. You've got a few different bits and pieces. I'm interested to see what they're doing with the story. I can't quite tell from the trailer if there's a lot that's pre- whatever the incident is to post whatever the incident is there seems to be a mixture of different bits and pieces in there because normally the interesting thing with fallout is what's been going on in the vault how people ended up in the vault and what mad experiment has vault tech been running on them while they've been in there at least in the games there's not many vaults that you come across where someone hasn't been trying to do something a little bit loopy in there so it's going to be an interesting watch i think i definitely will be giving this one a go when it comes out there's at least one flashback to the world ending mm. you see in the trailer all the the nukes going off definitely a thing from westworld is tricking people with timelines and scenes so there might be a bit i don't know if we're following just one protagonist or if they're going to be sort of jumping between a few different bits as they go one thing i'm wondering about is how will this stand out from other post-apocalyptic shows that we've mm. gotten over the years because it does look authentic to fallout but also i don't see an awful lot of difference between that and for example silo Silo was essentially in the vault, wasn't it, in some ways? To an extent, yeah. Silo is within a vault, for want of a better term, yeah. But even the technology aesthetic's not that different and stuff like that. Yeah. Silo doesn't really explore the outside, though. The whole point in Silo is very much that they're inside the vault, whereas this looks like they are exploring the wasteland outside. Yeah. The point of the Fallout games is... You start off in the vault and then you you go outside and have your adventure, pretty much, isn't it? Yeah. I wonder if they'll do the big test that you have to do in it was Fallout 3, that really long multiple choice test that you had to do. <laughs> Whatever it was you called. you got to find out all your stats so that you get all your stats by the end of it, yeah. Do you think they'll visually incorporate that targeting system that you have in the games? Vats, is it called? Potentially, yeah. The targeting and the little pit boy wrist computer. I imagine there'll be elements of that that they'll play in, definitely. They'll scatter bits and pieces through there. There's plenty of little bits of Fallout lore out there. Story that you get through all the different games. So they've got a lot of potential in there. Wonder if the aliens will show up. There's aliens in Fallout 3, <laughs> isn't there? 
There's little hidden aliens in all of them. There was a Fallout Doctor Who crossover as well. The TARDIS is in one of the point and click ones. <laughs> Brilliant. You walk up to it and it disappears. I think that's Fallout 2. It might be the first one. It's one of the pre-3D ones when it used to be the point and click, that style. Maybe the Doctor will show up for an episode. <laughs> Why not? It's the crossover we all want. Even though that's Amazon Prime crossing over with the BBC slash Disney. Legally, it just can't happen. Stupid lawyers or stupid <laughs> contracts. Curse you, copyright law. Yeah, damn it. Stopping us from having fun. Next trailer is another post-apocalypse kind of, or apocalypse happening, at least. ISS, standing for International Space Station. It's about two crews aboard the International Space Station from what turns out to be warring nations but that happens when they're up there. So you get to see a lot of them being friends and then war is declared and they're both ordered to kill each other and take over the space station. But will they do it or will they not? The trailer suggests that they will, but there's at least some doubt. I think this looks great. I really like the look of this. It seems like this confined space drama stuff is kind of my jam. I really like those sorts of films where there's characters stuck in one location and they have to figure a way out of it and i love the tension of we're at war technically but we're up here does it apply to us so yeah i'm really keen for this i'm in two minds about this you know me you know i like my space stuff yes love my space things that's all cool international space station is awesome now here's my thing the international space station is this great sign of international cooperation where we're all working together in space for the betterment of mankind, doing all these mad science experiments and managing to run a space station in orbit above the Earth right now in harmony. Ain't that awesome? That's brilliant. We can all agree that's brilliant. Yes. No one disagreeing? Perfect. Please don't mess up with the ISS. Come on. It's like our one little beacon of light. We can literally point it in the sky. Don't mess with the ISS. <laughs> Don't get me depressed. There's a few things coming up in these trailers that gets me depressed. It's an interesting what if. I will absolutely give you that. But in a world where things are depressing and nasty, can we leave one of the few beacons of international cooperation alone? Well, maybe that'll be the underlying point of it. This thing exists as a testament to the ability to cooperate. And we should honour that spirit by not murdering each other in zero gravity. That would be good if the trailer did not show them clearly ripping pieces off it. That would be lovely. True, but maybe that's only some of the people. Okay. Maybe after a few people die, it'll be, we shouldn't be doing this. We should be working together. In the end, when there's one Russian and one American and they decide to work together after killing off each other's compadres, I am sure we will get that loving moment. However, <laughs> in the meantime... But also, mission control is probably blown up, so there's no way back to Earth. So we're just here until we run out of air and die. Great. What a way to go. Yeah. Conceptually, it looks really interesting as a confined, tense horror experience. So I would definitely be giving this a go. It looks like most, if not all of it, will be set within the boundaries or perhaps slightly outside the ISS. So they only have a finite amount of space to work with, which in good examples can really drive creativity. Mm. In bad examples, doesn't. It's where they cheat and they have several scenes on Earth. I wonder what's going on up there, etc. Mm. So from a real world perspective, you find this depressing, but perhaps as a film, it might be interesting. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Next one is Godzilla X Kong, The New Empire. My first note is another one of these. <laughs> Talking about Godzilla Minus One earlier, which is a really thoughtful monster movie that has Godzilla in it. Whereas this looks like very much the opposite. I haven't enjoyed the monster verse as it appeared. The only one I liked was Kong Skull Island because that was just a bit of fun. But the others have just been haughty, depressing nonsense, really. And they introduce really weird concepts like the Hollow Earth later on, which they do nothing with, really. All the characters are cookie cutter and boring. You could give the lines to anybody and it wouldn't really make that much of a difference. Godzilla vs. Kong came out during the pandemic. And then when the cinemas reopened, as we were trying to come out of the pandemic, that was one of the films that was being screened. But I was thinking to myself, I can't even bring myself to go to IMAX to sit through all the crap to get to the monster on monster action sequences. Because I was just so bored by its attempt at telling a story. And I don't think it will have changed here. And this one looks like it's throwing even more crap in. There's a baby Kong because every franchise needs a baby thing that they can sell Funko Pops of. There's another giant ape causing trouble. Kong and Godzilla are buddies now. And Godzilla radiates pink energy for some reason. Don't know why. He just does. 
So I'll see this for hopefully some decent spectacle, but I'm not optimistic about anything surrounding that spectacle. Hopefully it's not just a long slog waiting for all the action to kick in, but I fear it will be because the other ones have more or less been that. I, for one, I'm delighted that we're continuing the monster math section following Godzilla minus one. We've now got Godzilla times Kong (laughs) for this one. I didn't see the last Godzilla one. It did not appeal this again doesn't really appeal i think i've kind of had my fill of this for the exact reason that you say the story is normally really difficult to tell the human angle of this and they rarely get it right a lot of the time you end up with a person running about and monsters being very vindictive of one person in particular in a crowd for no apparent (laughs) reason in the same way that you would chase one ant around the garden it doesn't track a lot of the time for me it just isn't enjoyable i've not really watched any of the monarch tv stuff that they've done either that is sort of loosely connected because i thought maybe in that they'll have more of a thing but i've watched i think about half an hour (laughs) as i gave it a little try because apple tv is normally pretty good with stuff for me but i haven't quite got into it yet i don't know if i just need to try it for a bit longer but this franchise hasn't particularly done a lot for me unfortunately i'm sure there will be some spectacle in it with godzilla and kong teaming up and creatures from we don't know where are attacking for reasons as yet unknown to reclaim the surface or whatever they want. The missing the human angle is the annoying part because it, it does give you less of a reason to invest in what's going on. So yeah, I'm watching a lot of pixels thrown together, hitting each other, but why should I care about it? And when I said about Godzilla minus one, Godzilla representing PTSD, it was perfect because it was just this physical representation of this thing that the main character is dealing with. And by fighting that monster, he then fights what he's suffering with, what he's dealing with. And better Godzilla films have dealt with that in in different ways. And I'm talking about in Japan, even the first one, the Gareth Edwards one, did that to some degree. Again, Godzilla is effectively a natural disaster and you have to prepare for it or get out of the way, but they didn't really lean into that too much. Even with Kong Skull Island, however silly it was, there was kind of an undercurrent of, because it was set around the time of Vietnam, the idea of, we're going to go here because we deserve to be here, when the message is, no, stay away, it's nothing to do with you. And you'll be punished for trying to put your stamp on it because it isn't for you. It's nothing to do with you. I struggle to think what the thematic connection would be in the other ones. They've done nothing to link the monster madness to something within us. Because that's what the monsters exist to represent. Something within us that we want to defeat or explore in some way. And they just don't do that anymore. Or certainly not in the American ones. So why are you making these? It's not what it's about, it's why it's about it. Mm. And I don't know why they're doing what they're doing. So, Will the spectacle be enough? Probably not. But will I see it for that spectacle? Possibly. But I'm not enthusiastic because they haven't done a great job so far. And I don't think this will be the one that changes that. Could be wrong, but no idea. Let's move on to self-reliance. Reality TV was always going to end up here. Let's face it. That's the natural direction of travel. Jake Johnson, though, he's really good usually. And he's directing and writing this one. So let's see how he does with that. Weird Andy Samberg playing himself, but kind of a evil bloodthirsty version of himself. Or maybe he's just like that in real life. I don't know the guy. (laughs) This looks a lot of fun. It seems to be about companionship and how dangerous rejecting companionship can be because it's team up with someone else and it will save your life. That's a pretty heavy handed message, but it's clear as day, I guess. You know what the film's about. Unlike the Monsterverse ones, I suppose. (laughs) So yeah, I'm looking forward to this, actually. I think it looks like it's good fun. This looks very weird and has the potential to be very funny and off the wall. I'm curious to see it. It has the feeling of a film that could go either way and it will either be 100% of one or 0%. You know what I mean? (laughs) It's either going to be the best thing that you've seen or the worst thing that you've seen. I do like Andy Samberg. I do like... A lot of these different things that could be kind of off the wall and very random and just you've got to accept the premise of this and then just move on. Then just get into it, go. So the fact that it sets up quite quickly what the guy's got to do and then, right, is he going to get his money and what does he discover along the way? And yeah, I am interested in this one. It stands out amongst a lot of what we've got on the list this month as being quite a fun watch. Plus Anna Kendrick's in it and despite the fact that she's largely the same in everything she does, I'm not sick of that yet somehow. She seems to be charming enough to overcome that because there's a lot of comedy actors where I'm like oh you again whenever I see them because they're just in the same shtick over and over again but she isn't one of them at least not yet and Jake Johnson like I said 
I've seen him in a few things and quite liked him. Do you just hear Peter B. Parker, though, whenever he speaks now? Because <laughs> I do. Like, oh, yeah, it's Spider-Man, his voice. So I guess he's done a good job of embodying that version of Spider-Man <laughs> to the point where the voice just sticks. But yeah, fun. It's the only kind of reality TV that I'm ever going to watch, as in a film that's about reality TV, not the reality TV itself. Although I do think that if they'd announced a Celebrity Hunger Games, I might be compelled to watch that. We're just going to stick some famous people that nobody likes on an island and the survivor gets to, well, live. No one will complain about them ever again. That'll be their prize. And they get to survive. Is that too bloodthirsty? I'm going to go with yes. But you'd watch it as well, wouldn't you? Maybe the first episode. Imagine they put James Corden and a bunch of other people that you don't like on an island and said, fight to the death. I'm more for putting them on an island, telling them it's all going to be filmed by secret cameras and then not doing anything <laughs> that would also work you just regularly fly them to an island and you go there's secret cameras everywhere that are going to be filming you and you win a prize if you win the show the rules will be explained to you once you're on the island parachute them onto the island and our work here is done <laughs> they would probably die but you wouldn't have to hear about it so your conscience would be clear i guess oh i mean what happens on the island is very much up to them <laughs> I would assume that they have built a colony and are living their best lives. A society made up of awful celebrities. Like a utopian society that I think they would all build working together, collaboratively, like a beacon of humanity. It would be humanity's lifeboat if plague spread throughout all the other continents that island of celebrities would survive. Well, that's even worse. The last of humanity is James Corden, Jared Leto. Or they would all eat each other out of desperation. Either one. Oh dear. You've made it worse. No, I've not made it worse. I've made it great because it is whatever you want to think it is. You're making it worse by thinking they'll all eat each other alive. I was saying that you build a utopian society. That's the worst part. That humanity dies and then what's left is these people. <laughs> It'd be the worst. Next up, we have Mr. and Mrs. Smith. This doesn't look as good as the film, but the cast is really good, so it might be worth a go. I wasn't really grabbed by the trailer that much, though. It just looked a bit by the numbersy, as in, mm. eh, this film was good, let's make a TV show out of it. Yeah, it kind of has the feeling of someone's been looking around for a concept of something that they can spin off into a TV show and they've come across this. I feel the same as you. Maybe they're holding stuff back for the trailer so they can make it a bit more fun when you watch it. If you put too much in the trailer, then you can kind of guess plot twists and things. They do have the potential of dropping nice surprises and stuff in there if they keep the trailers a bit tight. It's all about balance. If they lose confidence in it, they might throw tons more into a trailer as it gets closer to release. Yeah, maybe. I like the film though. Even though it destroyed Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston's marriage. <laughs> it was partly that film that tore them apart, apparently. Although, maybe they were in trouble before. I'm not going to feel guilty for enjoying a film because that happened. Celebrities get divorced all the time. Why does it have to be my fault? But I liked it. I thought Brad and Angelina were really good bouncing off each other and that. And I'm not quite getting the same vibe from the two in this. Donald Glover and what's her name? Maya, whatever her name is. So... I know. Maybe we'll see. Maybe I'll watch it. Maybe I won't. There's a good chance it'll just drop on Amazon and I'll forget it exists, especially since they're about to roll out their ad tier that you'd have to pay the US pricings and I was $3 more to get rid of. So screw that. But that's going to put me off watching stuff on Prime because I know I'll get adverts. Uh, the nice cycle of undercutting someone, taking all the business and then doing exactly what they were doing now that they're all gone. Yeah, what a cheek though. Oh, by the way, as of the end of this month, it's going to cost you an extra $3 if you want to get rid of ads. And not only that, we've got your shopping and your browsing history so we can target those ads and be extra specific. You're welcome. Yeah, and we're going to cut off your TV shows mid-sentence to interrupt them with an advert break as well. And make sure that when you hit that to skip button, you're not accidentally hitting buy it now. <laughs> God, that could Be happen. careful. It's in the same corner of the screen and it looks very similar. It's the YouTube ads that have the send to phone. Why would I want to send this to my phone? So you can buy it now, Craig. That's <laughs> why. Buy it now. <laughs> so Mr. and Mrs. Smith with or without ads. Maybe I won't watch it. I don't know. Moving over to Apple, who aren't screwing their customers quite yet, at least on their streaming service. It'll probably happen. Masters of the Air. For some reason, I have it in my head that you think this looks really good. It feels like it's going to be right up your street. But it's a World War II combat pilot thing. So it's a bit like Pearl Harbor, but maybe it won't suck. <laughs> Less sucky Pearl Harbor. 
It looks pretty epic and the attention to detail seems to be very impressive. That's what notes I have. Visually it looks really interesting. It's kind of, they've done vintage Top Gun, haven't they? Yeah. With some of the in-plane footage that they've done here. Yes, it does kind of interest me. I like a bit of my World War II history. So yeah, I probably will watch this one. At least give it a little shot. It's a nine-part series, so it's not too big a commitment to jump into. It looks pretty impressive. I am not sure of all of the historical fact and i don't know if historical fact may get in the way of their interesting fiction i imagine there will be a lot of hot takes on this did happen this didn't happen and potentially people that have been left out or their actions have been twisted in some sort of way so it'll be interesting what they've done from that point of view yeah definitely interesting in this one yeah it'll be interesting to see what events they skirt around or have adapted what real missions is this going to deal with you seem to find now that anything that's got a historical context follows behind it a bunch of people that say that didn't happen and this didn't happen that way and this character did it this way and there'll be several different theories about what did happen didn't happen and who said what when yeah so yes they often do these things where we never said we were doing a one-to-one representation of history this isn't a documentary it's a drama based on true events rather than these are true events yeah so we have characters that combine two or three real people into one person so that one person could do more rather than these three people that weren't really connected and all that stuff so when it comes to historical fiction i'm okay with that as long as you don't have them bombing hitler or whatever something insane (laughs) that definitely didn't happen that would have won them the war instantly kind of stuff (laughs) unless it's inglorious bastards in which case yeah absolutely riddle hitler with bullets because again not shooting for accuracy at all it's just you're using the time period i'm trying to think of relevant examples valkyrie i guess the tom cruise thing which mm. was about the plan to kill Hitler. I mean, you know it wasn't going to happen because, well, as far as we know, nobody killed him during the Second World War. I don't know much about my aerial campaigns during the Second World War, so I don't know what this will be taking on. It might just be generic stuff. Not that anything during the war was generic, but it might just be no famous missions or anything like that. Maybe it should be more about the people dealing with being at war and dealing with being mobilised to fight German planes or whatever at some point. I don't know. But it does look good. I will give them that. They put a lot of effort into bringing that to life, so... Clearly, they've spent a fair bit of money on it, which is kind of what you want with something like this, isn't it? A bit of authenticity. But maybe it won't be authentic, like you said. I think so. We'll see when it comes out. It does look interesting. I'll definitely give it a chance. You'll get some history nerds that'll be like, this plane actually didn't come into service until 1947, (laughs) and this was set in 1946 or whatever, which would be after the war. So... That's a bad example. (laughs) But you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Those kinds of guns weren't mounted on those types of planes until this year. You'll get a lot of that. You can clearly see that guy has an iPhone in the background. Starbucks cup in the middle of that cockpit. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. Anything like that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's move on to something else. It's a bit bleak. Civil War, which is Alex Garland's next film. I like Alex Garland. He is always worth paying attention to. He's done some great stuff. Done some mediocre stuff as well, but he's always interesting. He's giving us an extreme example of a broken world where people are being turned against each other, which is not as far-fetched as you might think. Basically, it's certain states in the US secede and then go to war with the US, hence the Civil War. Yeah, it's really bleak. Nick Offerman's the president, though. That surprised me. (laughs) It's difficult to see him in a role like that. I usually see him as somewhat comedic. So Mm. whenever he turns up in something like that, I'm like, I'm expecting you to make me laugh, but I don't think that's going to happen here. Yeah, it doesn't have the feel of many laughs, does it? It's part of what I've tagged as the depressing realism theme (laughs) that we've got. (laughs) Yeah, it's December. Let's release all the depressing stuff. Depressingly, this could come to pass kind of theme. In latter years, when things were looking merrier, you could look at something dystopian and go, wow, that's dystopian and an interesting take. And now you look at dystopia and you go oh god that could happen couldn't it (laughs) this could one day be a thing having a look at a two states united states and of course they're at war like you say it's an interesting let's take these situations and ramp it up to be even more serious you'd like to think it was in some way a cautionary tale other people will take it as a great idea (laughs) (laughs) let's make this a reality that's what we were trying to do all along yeah why did no one think of this sooner having two states it's so much simpler you could have two americas and then they could kill each other for dominance great idea let's do it now oh dear yeah so it's part of that theme it 
has the potential to be interesting. I don't know if I want to watch this. Simply from the point of view that some of this dystopia is getting a bit too close to home for me. (laughs) I kind of want to be cheered up sometimes when I go to the movies. There is not a lot of cheering up on this list. No, I suppose not. I like cinema for escapism. And I have the feeling over 2024, with politics in the world and the number of elections that are taking place across the world next year, we are going to have a lot of dystopia to watch on the news without watching it in the cinema. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but you can use actual news footage in your dystopian films. That's a problem. Yes. Like when Star Trek used footage from January the 6th to illustrate a point. Mm. Crazy. But I like Alex Garland's stuff. I usually watch the kind of stuff he's involved in. And this looks like something that he's certainly thinking about and wants to take it to its logical extreme, I suppose. The only thing the trailer doesn't really tell you about is the cause of it. There's a sort of hint that the president is corrupt, which wouldn't surprise me. So I wonder if the reveal will be that all of this was orchestrated by the rich, because there's too many poor people and we need to get them to kill each other. Too obvious, but then subtlety is out the window, isn't it? I've seen a lot of takes on films and TV shows where people have, or certainly some people seem to have forgotten how to read into things. So interpretation just doesn't exist. They take whatever the thing's presenting at face value and they don't think any deeper than that. So I wonder if we are just in an age where if you want to do some messaging in your film or TV show, then you cannot be in any way subtle. You have to beat people over the head with it. So there might be a scene where there's a bunch of cackling rich people in a room laughing about how they made this happen and they don't hate each other at all. They're not at war at all because this was the plan. Oh God, that's even more sinister and depressing. Jeez. I was just thinking that you could combine maybe this ISS and Fallout into one shared universe. They all create each other, yeah. Yeah, so like the ISS is looking down at the civil warring United States with nukes flying about and at the end of that is Fallout. There you go. The outcome of that is Fallout. There you go, you're welcome. There we go, combined all them together. Nice. Three things in one film. Yeah. Except none of them are made by the same people. Let's just assume that they are. My headcanon is that they are. (laughs) Let's not get facts get in the way, Craig. This is 2023. Facts mean nothing. Alternative facts. Make up your own facts. And by 2024, when this eventually goes out, facts definitely mean nothing. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, let's move on to June part two. I mean, this doesn't look especially cheery either. (laughs) I think this trailer shows too much. It's trailer three, so we're kind of in the territory of, why is this in the marketing? You've shown us way too much here. It does look really good, but I predicted that it would because I've seen the first one and that looked great and it's the same people making it. This one has even more of Hollywood elite actors in it, so cramming them into whatever roles. Some of them have quite small roles, which is quite funny. But yeah, I mean, it looks great and it'll be good to see the actual end of the story because one of my criticisms of the first one is it's not a film. It's half a film. Mm. So now we have the other half of the film. And Denis Villeneuve said he's writing the script for Dune Messiah, even though that's not confirmed that they're actually going to make it. But he wants to make it if he gets to it. But yeah, this trailer is definitely far too much. Yes. I agree that if someone has not seen any of the previous Dune content or read the books that have been out for a while, this trailer probably does reveal a bit too much. But I am looking forward to seeing this film. I think the first one was visually amazing. Just the style choices that they made by it, the shots, the cinematography for it was just astounding. Quite an epic soundtrack on a big screen experience as well. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing this one. I have read Dune and I've read Dune Messiah. I've got Children of the Dune sitting on a shelf behind me waiting to be read at some point. But yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to this. I think they did some really interesting visual choices with the last one. They did some interesting story point things. So getting to see this, yes. And I'm kind of glad to hear that he's thinking of doing the next one or at least prepping to do it that means that he's got a lot of confidence in it i hope it gets bums on seats don't think villeneuve having confidence in it makes any difference really it's just he wants to do it he's well known for getting pretty high budget projects that don't make any money so you'd never see them again like blade runner for example Mm. blade runner 2049 it was one of the best films that year and it looked amazing but it just made no money So nothing else happened with it from that point of view anyway. They've done different Blade Runner stuff since, like Mm. the animated show and things like that. But in terms of that setting up some kind of resurgence of the concept, it just didn't go anywhere. So the fact that Dune made enough money for them to at least commit to making the second one, because they only committed to making this one, half a film, and then the second one was greenlit much later. Imagine if it had just been half a film and then abandoned because it didn't make any money. And then it stopped. 
how did it do at the box office? Throwing that random question out there. I can't remember how it did the first part in the box office. Made a profit for sure. Like made enough for them mm. green like the second one. It wasn't a done deal. Mm. Whether this does enough to make a third one, I don't know. I really hope that certainly our local cinema, they do a double bill of the two in IMAX. So you can see the whole concept. God, that'd be pretty long though, wouldn't it? Yeah, but we've done it before. We saw three Star Wars films back to back. It'd be about as long as that. We did, and my backside hasn't recovered. <laughs> You'd see the first one, you get 20 minutes to go for a walk between them, and then you come back. I would absolutely do that double bill. I don't know if I could handle that one. It's the best way to experience it, probably. I think I could experience it awake the next day and have just as good a time. <laughs> but you wouldn't get to see the first one in IMAX immediately before the second one. No, I wouldn't. you're right. That's what you want. When I said about showing too much, I didn't even mean narratively. I just meant some of the visuals. I was thinking, I'd love to just see that for the first time in context rather than seeing it now on my TV screen or on a phone screen or whatever people use to watch trailers. Let me pivot that the other way and go, that's what they're willing to visually show you in a trailer on your screen. Imagine what they're holding back for the film. Let me put the positive spin on it for you. Well, how many trailers have we seen where we go see the final film and think, oh, well, all the cool stuff was in the trailer. <laughs> oh, we've seen a lot of that. But let me try and do the positive spin just to counteract here, just to be the yin to your yang or whatnot. Remember, the film director almost never makes the trailer. It's usually cut together by some marketing people. I don't know if that's the case here, but it's usually the case. Either way, I know I'll like it, so it's fine. So I suppose I could have just not watched the trailer, I guess. I need to fire the idiot that put it on the list for us to talk about. Who could have done that, I wonder? I don't want to point any fingers. It'll be reflected in their end-of-year appraisal. Okay, let's move on to IF which stands for Imaginary Friend, directed by John Krasinski. It's got Ryan Reynolds in it. Basically, what if Imaginary Friends were real? It's a bit Monsters, Inc., in a way, conceptually. Imaginary Friends is like a business, almost, and they pass down from child to child after people grow out of having imaginary friends. They just pass on and on and on. And it seems like there's some element of creating imaginary friends in there, so kids can do that as well. It just seems weird and interesting, and some of the visuals are really awesome. It's a bit like a Pixar movie, but with real people in it that's true you can't imagine this is an animated pixar thing can't you yeah it looks a lot of fun the i was going to say the monsters that's completely wrong the imaginary friends that look like monsters <laughs> all seem to be different styles different takes of things of a corridor scene where they're walking down and there's a few different people hanging about i kind of like that every child's imagination is completely different and i've come up with all these weird concoctions it's got quite a voice cast in it i imagine it's going to be one of those films where you spend a lot of time going hang on i recognize that voice what do i recognize that voice from this kind of looks fun this is one of the ones that stood out for me i think because it's sandwiched in amongst dystopia i thought do you know what this looks fun this is what i go to the cinema for ridiculousness <laughs> john krasinski's a good director he's proven with quiet place and, and things like that mm. and ryan reynolds you know what you're getting with ryan reynolds deadpool basically you just get that over and over again so yeah i like this like i said it feels like a Pixar movie, except it isn't a Pixar movie. <laughs> we'll see if it has more to it than just, oh, this was a good idea. Because a lot of these, this is a great idea, but sloppily executed. I'm hoping it's not that, but I have faith in Krasinski after he's proven himself a bit. And this is different to what he did last time. There's a bit of singing and dancing in the trailer as there well. Is. So I don't know if there's a bit of music and stuff going on in there. We will find out. But it looks cool. Hmm. The next one is less cheery. It's Handling the Undead. Don't you usually put foreign language movies on here, but I found it quite interesting anyway. And by the time I'd started watching the trailer, I didn't realise it was a foreign language movie until the subtitles came on. So it's one of those. <laughs> I really like this idea. Oh God, <laughs> subtitles. Oh no. My issue with subtitles is my brain struggles to watch and read at the same time. So I can't ever feel like I can fully take in the thing that I'm watching because my brain does one or the other. So I end up missing half of what it's trying to do in a lot of cases. But it's it's an interesting way of handling what amounts to a zombie story. It takes a different angle on that. The idea of what would you do if people you knew were coming back to life? And I guess it asks questions about the meaning of life and what it means to lose people or what it would be like to get those people back after you've dealt with that loss as well. Maybe that's in there. It looks unsettling and creepy as well. So it seems like a really cool run at this. Yeah, I was curious as to how this one appeared on the list, but I'll go with it. Yeah, it looks interesting and weird and dark i will not be watching it but <laughs> it seems to be interesting in many ways and i am sure people will watch it yes indeed maybe there'll be a english language remake of it one day do you know what if it does well it can dream <laughs> the fact that it's foreign language doesn't particularly put me off it just doesn't look like my kind of 
thing, to be honest. It looks like the kind of thing that if it was on the TV, I would get distracted and start looking at my phone. <laughs> I think if I was going to commit to this film, I would need to commit to be in the cinema so that I did not get distracted by everything else that was around me. On a subtitle film, it'd be game over if you got distracted by your phone, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's the problem, is that if you get partway through, you get distracted, you lose track of what's going on because you can't listen and watch and get... So yeah, I would need to commit to be in the cinema to see this one, and I'd don't think it has anything in there that would get me to devote that time, unfortunately. Unless it ends up being a secret screening. Not my particular gravy. But we might go to a secret screening, and then it turns out to be that. Mm -hmm. And then you have to make a choice. Am I going to give this a go, or am I going to be one of the hashtag wasted snacks brigade? Sometimes that roulette wheel works out, and sometimes you watch Crawl. I was happy with Crawl. I, I enjoyed that. I think it's probably one of the better examples of a secret screening that we had, actually. Dungeons and Dragons, that was the best example. That was indeed the best example. Yeah, that was the best turnout that we ended up having. That was not Crawl. That was very good. <laughs> Move on. We have He Went That Way. Good to see Zachary Quinto in a film again. Although I did find it difficult to accept that he wasn't playing the psychopath considering heroes and mm. how good he was at that. But Jacob Elordi looks like he's doing a good job in that role. So it looks like a great little back and forth between the two of them and a fun enough, I say fun enough, a bleakly fun enough concept of this you're on the road with a psychopath type story that we've seen plenty of. Quite like it. This trailer took so many different turns for me when I was watching it, where it's, yeah, I'm a serial killer and I went on this trip and do you not want to know about the one guy that I left on alive? And then it sort of cuts and then it's in the car and there's a banging in the back and it's a trained chimp. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, 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 hang on. There was like serial killer kind of stuff going on and now trained chimp. Okay, I guess... And then there's a robbery and then there's people in the middle of the desert and there's people being abandoned and cars driving across the place and there's gunshots and violence and a trained chimp and what appears to be theft of said trained chimp. And also at one point something comes on and goes based on true events. Just to add extra weight to this production, I'm kind of interested in reading the real story over the film. I'm kind of wanting to find out that, whoa, 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 this again, but slower. Explain to me what happened here. You know what they say, truth is stranger than fiction. Indeed, and this is definitely one of those cases. Yeah, it's a weird one. It's the kind of thing that Zachary Quinto turns to turn up in now. He's gotten a lot of weird off the wall films. I guess he made the Star Trek in Heroes Money and now he just does whatever he wants. And Jacob Elordi's on the rise. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce his name. But he's definitely on the rise. He's moving into the spotlight in a way after his run at Elvis for Priscilla, which I haven't seen yet. It's out on New Year's Day in the UK at the cinema. I know it's out on digital now already, but I'll wait till the cinema and watch it there. I wonder if this is one that was filmed before he was going to be the next hot property. So it was whoever's distributing this or whoever produced it was looking in the stuff that they've got and thought, yeah, we can get this out now because it's got this guy in it. It happens a lot with films when one of the stars has ended up in a blockbuster and they suddenly become bankable. And it's like, oh yeah, we have this in the archive. Now we could release it. Happened to a couple of Jeremy Renner films, for example. After he was in Avengers, it was, oh yeah, we, we made this two years ago. Let's uh, throw it out. So that could be that. I don't know. It looks watchable anyway. Do you think you'll watch it or will you just read the Wikipedia about the real events? I don't know. I might end up watching this. This is probably one that genuinely, if it was some sort of secret screening type thing that I would stay and watch. But I don't know if I would choose to go and see it at the cinema. It might be something that when it pops up in an on-demand thing, I give it a chance. I give it the 30 minute rule. <laughs> it will always be there under the you haven't finished this section yeah you watched this once partly are you ever going to finish this Chris continue watching question mark yeah I think that's maybe one of the things that the streaming platforms would add is uh, you started this and we won't allow you to start anything else until you finish it <laughs> or pay us a dollar and you can start the next thing that you want to try <laughs> yeah pay us a dollar to unlock your buffer to unlock the buffer, to allow you to remove this film from your current watching list, you need to pay us a dollar. Am I going to have to edit this out? Because you're giving them ideas. I'm giving them ideas. Yeah, edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to Love Lies Bleeding, which has Christian Stewart in it. This is one that I found difficult to figure out what was the point of it based on the trailer, which suggests that it's not a very good trailer. Because it's a bit muddled in that there's a love slash lust story, a revenge tale, and there's bodybuilding being visualised as body horror, which is 
quite alarming. So what is this about? Is it about body image? Is it about the extremes that people will go to to reach a certain shape and size or whatever? Is it about this toxic love lust story? Is it about how revenge consumes you? Is it all of them? Is it none of them? I really don't know. Yeah, I'm similar to you. This one didn't really appeal, didn't push any buttons for me, apart from the fact that it's got some interesting people in it. I do like Ed Harris when he appears in things. Didn't really push much for me. Like you say, it's kind of got a bit of body horror stuff in there. It's tagged as a romantic thriller, but that's about as much as I could make out from the film. It got a bit of murder and a bit of cover-up and a bit of, I'm going to rat you out to the FBI and it, there's a lot of confusing bits in there I'm not too sure what this one's aiming for and because I can't tell what it's aiming for I can't tell if I would watch it I'm very much on the this is probably not going anywhere near a watch list camp it's probably not for me either but I am interested to find out what the film is actually about I listed four or five things there that the trailer gets at but which is it that's the problem I had with Ferrari it's like three things happening all at once and you're not really doing anything with one of them yeah the thing is in order to sell something in a trailer you need to tell the audience what it is the fact that both of us are sort of struggling to describe what this film looks like it is and what it's aiming for means that you've got a problem because audiences then don't know what to expect and I think a lot of the time now especially with the amount of money it costs to go to the cinema you've kind of got to know that you've got a surefire bet when you're going in and if there's something that's just very vague then you're unlikely to commit your money to it unless you're an indie bro and it's like yes this looks like it will be amazing because I have no idea what it is so I'll watch <laughs> if you're a fan of particular distribution companies then maybe <laughs> If you're a huge Film 4 fan, this one might be the one for you. Is it Film 4 that we're distributing this? I didn't even pay that much attention. It's a co-production between Film 4 and a lesser known outfit that's named after several sizes of paper, I think. Okay. Distribution companies. Let's not talk about them. Yeah. Big Film 4 fan, so yeah. <laughs> Moving on. I'm going to guess you're not liking this one, but Night Swim looks like a fairly standard horror movie, but actually a pretty decent example of it. It's Bloomhouse, so... There tends to be something a bit below the surface with them most of the time. Nah. Ah. Yeah, there's a lot of water in it ah. so beneath the surface. Uh, yeah. nice, nice. I made a similar joke after Aquaman, didn't I? It was because it took them so long to release a sequel and it's like, yeah, they should have ridden the crest of that wave. Ah. Two water jokes in one. You get your money's worth on this podcast. If you spent nothing, you get your money's worth. If you spent something, you got two jokes for the price of one. Yeah, no refunds. Yeah, no refunds. Just... You can withdraw your support at any time, I suppose. <laughs> it looks pretty creepy. There's a lot of jump scares, which I tend to find in horror is, is the cheapest way to freak someone out. Well, you just go boo and scare someone that way. That doesn't work on me usually. I very rarely fall for a jump scare, mostly because they're usually very well telegraphed. You know, there's a very tense moment, build up, build up, build up, build up, and you're just waiting for the tension to be released by something jumping out and going boo or something similar. There's quite a few of those in the trailer, which means they won't work in the film because I've seen them in the trailer and I know roughly when they appear. So there's that, but it looks all right. Looks interesting enough. You pretty much nailed on what I was going to say at the beginning. This is not for me. It's not my kind of film whatsoever. I am not a big horror person at all. It looks like it's full of jump scares and stuff, which again, doesn't really appeal. It's not really got anything going for it for me. Horror, not my particular thing. So just instantly when it, you start getting the little piano chords of the this is a horror film trailer <laughs> music, I instantly go, well, that one's not for me. Before you even see anything. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, well, this one's written off immediately. I don't think it's going to be a classic, but it might still be reasonably decent. Have to ask Andrew, because he's the horror aficionado amongst us. Yeah, unfortunately, this one's not my particular thing. It looks like it does all the horror movie things in the trailer. So for horror movie people, this may be a horror movie. <laughs> Next up, we have No Way Up, which is about a plane that gets stuck at the bottom of... The ocean, or under the ocean anyway, with people inside it. It's another one of those claustrophobic, we're stuck in a location type films, which I said earlier, seems to be my jam. I'm always interested in these. I love the idea. There are sharks, which causes complication, and Call Minis in it. Chief O'Brien himself, he is in this film, but he's not the pilot or anything. He's not going to fix the plane. Although he does seem to take charge. So maybe he is going to solve the problem with some kind of technical knowledge that he has somehow. He's the bodyguard of a girl that's going on the holiday on a gap year thing 
or her dad. I don't know. No, it, he's a bodyguard, according to the beginning of the trailer, I think. Maybe I paid way too much attention. <laughs> you just saw Chief O'Brien, you're like, I'm hanging on your every word. I was like, Chief O'Brien, I like him, and I want to see this because <laughs> of him, but also everything else in the plot tells me... No. You get to see a plane crash, you get to see them crash in the water, you get to see the fact that they sink to the bottom of the sea and there's a little pocket of air for them to survive in for X amount of time. Two hours. As the water will flood the cabin at the speed of plot. I like that it's like, oh, and there's divers coming down. I'm like, wow, they've spoiled the ending. The divers have found the crash plane already. They've kind of spoiled the ending of the film there. There must be something that happens after that. And then the divers get eaten by sharks. Really vindictive sharks. Well, hasn't film taught you that sharks are assholes? They just attack people? Apart from Bruce in Finding Nemo, vindictive sharks who, once they're fed, don't go away. They decide they're going to take lumps out of the aeroplane and make it sink more because sharks are evil. Because that's easier than going for all the fish that will be nearby. Yeah, so instead of going for all the prey that is around them at that time, and presumably, I don't know other bodies that have fallen out of the plane as it crashed they're like we're ignoring those ones we're going to go for the ones that are inside the metal tube that's going to take us ages to get at because sharks like a challenge (laughs) that's it it doesn't feel like a good meal unless they've had to really work for it yeah there's all these people that have fallen out the plane as it's been coming out the sky we're not going for any of them we're going to go for this lot in particular at the bottom of the water because screw you miles o'brien that's why (laughs) because you've not suffered enough i get what you say It looks interesting. It's confined space. It's, oh, how are they going to get out? How are they going to survive? Are they going to survive? Oh, there's only one way to find out. And it's to watch this for probably two blinking hours. So, no, it doesn't appeal. Sorry. I'll be watching this. Absolutely. Fun concept, but doesn't appeal. Like I say, I love these claustrophobic, I'm in one location things. Because I like to see how filmmakers tackle that challenge. I've got this one confined set that I need to film in. How do we do it? I'm going to go with this was a horrible shoot to do because everything was submerged in water for a lot of it in a (laughs) confined space. I imagine the stories you would get from the cast and the crew that made this would make a true horror film. It was wet. It was cold. We had to do multiple takes. Yeah, lights and electronics were shorting out all over the place. We couldn't get clear sound and we had to overdub everything because there was always water. I imagine it was a nightmare and I look forward to that being the bonus footage. (laughs) I will watch the bonus footage of the making of. We'll just watch the special features on Titanic. It'll be much the same thing. We're wet, we're cold. I almost drowned. Variations on that. Call me he's, he's 60s now, isn't he? Something like that. Maybe older. And they're sticking him in a fiberglass tube, essentially. I wonder how they convinced Call me to do that because... At his age, you would think, I don't have to be doing this. There must be something in it that interested him. Hmm. Maybe he just really needs the money. Who knows? There's probably a lot more story depth and stuff to the characters Uh, and the things that are not in the trailer. Yeah, but it just doesn't push my buttons. I'm sorry. It's not a high strike rate for this trailer (laughs) section, unfortunately, this month. I'm sorry, people. Maybe I'm in a bad mood. Not even Chief O'Brien would get you in here. I like to be honest. This is the thing. I like to be honest on this podcast. And I could lie and I could say, yeah, I'm going to go there because it looks all right. I've got to be honest. All right does not get me buying tickets at the moment. Time is short and it's limited. But what it could do is it could help add up the spreadsheet to make your unlimited card worth it. That is true. It could do. Other cinema limited cards are available. And I don't know if... Sony World want to donate some unlimited cards to us? Why would they? We always pay for them. That's true. But I don't think this would get me buying a ticket, unfortunately. This one does have the added advantage of Vindictive Sharks, which another film that we will be talking about later does not have. Tease for later in the podcast. Indeed. Oh yeah, stick around to find out which one Chris is talking about, folks. Let's move to our next thing, Miller's Girl, which is Jen Ortega and Martin Freeman, which is a good start like both of them. It looks like it's a film about Jenna Ortega baiting Martin Freeman into an inappropriate relationship. She's a student, he's a teacher. It seems like an interesting dynamic. It's a bit of a reverse Me Too story in a way, because he's the one that wants to keep that student-teacher distance, and she doesn't. But it also seems like she's coerced into pursuing that sort of a relationship with him by her friends for some reason. So there's a lot going on here. And I did notice at the end of the trailer, it says, this film contains some complex themes. (laughs) I don't think I've ever seen a trailer advertise that before, especially at the end. 
Yeah, we're not quite sure how to brand this, so let's just go with the word complex. Yeah, There's a lot about this that I'm interested in. I think it could be a quite an uncomfortable, thought-provoking watch, and I'm kind of into that as an idea. And like I say, Jenna Ortega and Martin Freeman really like them. Yeah, I think you're in for two good performances in that film, if nothing else. Yeah. What else did you think of the trailer? That was about it, to be honest. <laughs> Again, it looks like an interesting sort of what if story, seeing the impact that the relationship has on one another. There's definitely a bit of if this relationship gets out, how will I be treated on either side of that? But yeah, that was about it. I wonder if it, the film will tackle the often overlooked side of it as in even if I do nothing and I'm accused of doing something my career and life are essentially over from the Martin mm. Freeman side because there is that problem of obviously there's so many examples of when people have abused their position and taken advantage and all that stuff but there are also the less reported on examples of people that have been accused who haven't done anything but nobody will believe them even when it's proven that they didn't do anything so I wonder if it'll get at that yeah that's interesting it potentially will. Normally what happens is it gets to the point where this has been going on so long and I haven't reported it myself that now if it gets reported, I'm going to be in bother for not mentioning that anything was going awry to begin with. Yeah. That I was receiving unwelcome advances because I didn't say that or I didn't declare that something was going on earlier. Then now it looks like there's something been going on even if nothing's happened kind of thing. I don't know what the true weight of those statistics are between reported v innocence and whatnot. I don't really want to go down that particular line because I don't know enough. No, me neither. But it can be an interesting character thing. And because of the two leads in this, I, having not watched it, obviously I've watched the trailer, I have the feeling it'll be done well. I don't imagine them picking up that script and doing it badly. Hope not. I think they'll definitely be meat to it. But yeah, I'm not desperate to see it. Again, it would be like an interesting one if it pops up on telly or something. Well, I'll probably see it when it comes out. Just for the, the actors alone. I always like watching Martin Freeman and Jenna Ortega. So give it a look. Next up, we have The Kitchen. My first note is there's a lot of wheelies going on in this trailer. Everyone's on a bike is doing a wheelie. Whether it be a motorbike, a dirt <laughs> bike, or a bicycle. People are wheeling all over the place. This film is about a dystopian future where all social housing has been eliminated. So about five years from now, possibly sooner. Looks like there's a bit of police brutality, race issues. Great to see our world almost as it is be represented as a dystopian future. Excellent. Although it's unrealistic because people fight for what they believe in and might actually accomplish something. <laughs> so I can't buy into that because that doesn't happen in real life. But, you know, it's aspirational, I suppose. It does look, I'm not going to say good, but there's something in there. It's certainly an angle that's worth exploring, especially because a lot of people will be dealing with the fact that it's harder and harder to find a place to live and the social programs to be homed just do not exist at the level they should in order to make sure people have a place to live. So certainly a topical issue to make an extreme dystopian sci-fi film about. It might not even be sci-fi, just an extreme dystopian future film about. And people will look at it and think, oh yeah, it's pretty much my life. So thanks. My note, again, this was ah more dystopia this time it's london <laughs> genuinely what i wrote underneath this one here's my expected joke all the press screenings will still be there ah yeah it's not even a joke it's what would happen again yeah it looks interesting depressing more dystopia interesting people making it which means it's probably got something to say it's probably got an interesting message in there i don't know if it'll depress me too much like you say Plenty wheelies going on and bikes and motorbikes. If you like people on bikes doing wheelies, then this is the film for you. Yeah, distinct lack of scooter stunts. I was thinking maybe we'd get some electric scooters and stuff in there. Bring it up to date for the modern age. I was disappointed at the lack of that. But in this dystopia, all electric vehicles have been outlawed because... Reasons. Down with that sort of thing. Because killing the world, that's what we rich people want to do. <laughs> yeah. Don't want to get political, though. Yeah, let's not. I've already went there. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so I came on with this going, oh, okay, this might be an interesting watch. Not sure. Kind of on the fence a little bit. I could probably be talked into this one, I think. Cool. Well, that's something, at least. Let's move on to The Bricklayer, which is an action film where Aaron Eckhart is trying to get noticed again. 
happens every few years. He's in something like this. His career goes nowhere and the cycle repeats. Nina Dobrev is in this as well. She is actually really good. I've seen her in a couple of things thinking, yeah, you've definitely got something. There's something to you. I didn't watch Vampire Diaries, which is what she was in, but I imagine she gets sort of roundly dismissed because of that, as a lot of actors that came from CW shows do. She's actually really good, but I don't think this is going to be the best showcase for her talents either. It looks like a pretty standard action movie. It's stylistically a Bourne movie or a Bourne clone a few years too late. Just looks like one of those doesn't it the sort of trailer that you saw 15 of in like 2004 yeah you've got uptight operative v doesn't play by the rules operative will they get along and there's double crosses we've got to find out who's been double crossed and who's been leaking secrets before more secrets get more leaked because apparently there's more leaks and there's dimly lit rooms with screens where people are looking at those screens there's files on the table that have serious notes and things underlined and redactions. Who redacted the thing and how did we find out the stuff? And meanwhile, while that's going on, I'm going to break this guy's nose. You've kind of summed it up, to be honest. Still looks like one of those. You can kind of tell what's going to happen, I guess. <laughs> it's going to go one way or the other. There's probably about two possible outcomes of this film. And as you go through, you'll be like, OK, well, it's not going to be that outcome. It's going to be this one. You'll watch it. And then by the time you get to the end, you'll think, I have no idea what this was about. And I also don't care. Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. <laughs> yeah, so I can't say I'm that excited about this. Looks like I've seen 15 of these already. And yes, I know we talk a lot about comic book films here, so it could be a pot calling the kettle mm-hmm. black situation in terms of, but you watch a lot of comic book movies and they're all the same. And I don't disagree. But also, I've already seen a lot of these and they don't have the claim of a shared universe to keep me interested. Do I want to watch Aaron Eckhart and uh, an actress who had her big break on TV and now wants to do films and keeps ending up in stuff that is frankly beneath her in, in terms of how talented she actually is? So yeah, this doesn't grab me. It really doesn't. So that'll be no love for the bricklayer. Although I do like that the origin of the name is in the trailer where someone hands him a trowel. Yeah, points at the screen and go, he said the line! Someone hands him a trowel and says, lay this brick. And he's like, of course I will, because I'm the bricklayer. That isn't the actual dialogue, but it might as well be. It is building up to a cinematic universe of its own, where you're going to have the plumber, the plaster, the joiner. Yes, it will all culminate in the tradesman. The tradesman initiative. (laughs) Where they all team up and build a house, because they have all the skills necessary to be able to do it. (laughs) You may be wondering why I've gathered you all here. Just want to build a house. Uh, yeah, I've bought this plot. This is the architect and here's the designs. <laughs> but people complain because the architect wasn't introduced in a previous film. Well, I don't know who this guy is. He's been hinted at all along. Let's move on. This one is way short as a teaser. In fact, I've had to support it with some Wikipedia stuff. It's a shame it's Adam <laughs> Sandler because I don't like Adam Sandler, but it's going to be potentially quite popular. So it's on here. We have to acknowledge the popular stuff, even if it isn't for us. And I don't know, maybe you love Adam Sandler, but I don't. Anyway. The 30 seconds doesn't tell you much, although it does tell you what a lot of the summary backs up. The summary is, as an astronaut sent to the edge of the galaxy to collect mysterious ancient dust, finds his earthly life falling to pieces, he turns to the only voice who can help him try to put it back together. It just so happens to belong to a creature from the beginning of time lurking in the shadows of his ship. I did not get that from the trailer. Although there was some talk about being at the edge of the galaxy or something in this 30 seconds. I mean, it's about 30 seconds worth, like you say, of a person in a blue spacesuit walking through a jungle forest scape. Possibly on Earth, possibly not on Earth, possibly at the edge of the galaxy, who knows, roll a dice, in his mind palace, in his brain dreaming, whatever. We don't know. I did not get very much from this. I am just curious. My interest has peaked because space, but I've got no idea. And how do you feel about Adam Sandler? I can take him or leave him. I don't have any strong feelings on Adam Sandler. I've seen him in films that I've liked. I've seen him in films that I've disliked. I just always find him tedious. And people keep trying to tell me to watch Uncut Gems because apparently he's really good at that. And I keep answering with, why would I watch him in Uncut Gems? I cannot stand him when I do watch him. (laughs) This isn't going to change my mind. Hang on, I've just had a text. Oh, Adam Sandler says he doesn't like you either. I don't know how he got my number. Ask him what Kevin James thinks of me then. (laughs) I wonder if Kevin James is in this. Or maybe he's moved away from that because he's trying to be a serious actor now. I don't know. But anyway, the trailer gives us almost nothing. But that summary at least tells me something about what this film is about. Unlike the trailer. Why would you release this 30 second teaser? Because it wasn't in any way enticing, I don't think, actually. It's just some guy in a spacesuit standing in a forest. Well, some weird dialogue plays. It's someone being arty, isn't it? 
Yeah, but it's Adam Sandler. And wanting to pique a bit of interest and in doing the, oh, everyone's going to wonder what this is about and start Googling, which we did. You caught us. <laughs> I think that's about it, really, isn't it? It's like weird little trailer just to tease that something is a thing and get people theorising. Yeah, but also your trailer has given me homework. <laughs> yes. We criticise films or TV shows by expecting us to do homework. Now trailers are expecting us to do homework. There's so many trailers that don't include a synopsis of the film at the bottom. Not as someone that's been trying desperately to find out what some of the stuff is that I've been made to watch for this podcast today. But there's a lot that do not include a synopsis at the bottom. They don't even tell me if it's a TV show. Oh, I've made that mistake before. I've talked about something as if it was a film and then been corrected. Look forward to seeing this at the cinema. But Chris, it's a... 20 part TV <laughs> <laughs> it was the Idris Elba hijack thing I made that ah, mistake right, with okay. I thought it was a film but it's not it's a mini series I think I did the same when I saw that trailer actually how we laughed still haven't seen it if it had been a film I might have watched it that's the irony I think what happens is the plane gets hijacked and it crashes and then it sinks to the bottom of the sea and then the sharks take over the plane but is it that Idris Elba dies on impact and that's why he's not in the Chief O'Brien part of the movie. <laughs> His first episode. He gets taken out, but they've used him in all the marketing materials. Yeah. I'd love that. <laughs> TV executives make that a thing. Good work. Hire big budget actors for episode one, send them on the entire publicity tour, kill them off in the first episode. Well, they used to kind of do that. It was more with directors, though. They would get big name directors to write the first episode of something. Yeah, and then send them out on the publicity tour. The strain was one of those. Guillermo del Toro, he did the first episode. He produced the series as well but producing is most of the time just putting your name on it i think at that level anyway i think spielberg even did that as well he's directed an episode of a tv show that he then left and left to other people or like joss whedon with agents of shield mm. we're getting towards the end of our trailer list this one beverly hills cop axel f which is another beverly hills cop movie i have only seen this was the fourth one i don't know if i've even seen all three of the other ones i've definitely seen one of them but it was so long ago and probably only once but i do recognize that they are really funny because it was eddie murphy at his prime at the height of his popularity and where he was doing really good stuff but my reaction to this when i'm looking at it is do we really need another one of these? It screams nostalgia trip to me. And also it's Eddie Murphy who's way past his best. I talked about it before because he was in a Christmas movie that came out around Christmas, funny mm. enough, last year slash this year. And it's a bit like that as well. Eddie Murphy is no longer a sign of quality when he's in something. So is that going to be that? And also when I was reminded of the theme tune, I was just wondering, hasn't that been sampled enough by now? At least it wasn't the crazy frog version. <laughs> I took the same note underneath this. I have a bullet point that says that there's four of them. With a question mark. <laughs> I have definitely not seen them all. I think I've seen the first one. And even at that, I'm struggling to remember it. So yeah, if it's going for nostalgia, I am not nostalgic about this. Therefore, I will not be particularly queuing up. I also had in my head, oh, it's a comedy kind of thing, isn't it? Is Eddie Murphy is the comedy sort of thing? Or was this a serious thing? It's an edgy comedy. Edgy comedy because the trailer, I was like, this is very funny am i misremembering am i getting franchises mixed up here and getting everything around the wrong way the trailer didn't really do anything for me to be honest it zooped up axel f a bit cool not my cup of tea at least it's not in a dystopian future so <laughs> it's got that going for it i'll give it points for that no it's just in present day beverly hills which may be dystopian present day it's not dystopian beverly hills it's the latest stop on the nostalgia train isn't it hmm Anybody that really liked the previous Beverly Hills Cop movies will maybe be into this. But yeah, it's probably not for me. I mean, I haven't seen them. It even seems like the edges have been sandied off a bit, judging by this trailer. From what I remember, the Beverly Hills Cop movies are, like I say, edgy comedy. So there's a lot of swearing and stuff like that. And a lot of adult themes and violent themes and whatever else. I may be misremembering or thinking of something else. I don't know. But certainly, if it was edgy, then the edges have been completely removed from this trailer. Mm. Which I guess is disappointing in a way, because if you're going to bring Eddie Murphy back to do something like this, then really try and put him back in that space. Yeah, if you're going to do nostalgia, then throw in nostalgia. Yeah. You can see the reviews now. It came back, but who cares? That kind of stuff. It feels like that will be how this lands. You need to do a lot to remind people of what they liked in the previous stuff. And the fact that we are kind of struggling to remember the plot of the previous three probably means that you're not doing well with your nostalgia tour. You need people to be nostalgic in order to bring something back. If you're doing, I don't know, Ghostbusters or something like that, there's a lot of nostalgia there. There's a lot of people that know and love their 
Ghostbusters, I don't imagine there's a lot of people out there that are like, oh my God, thank God they're bringing back Beverly Hills Cop. Some of it seems to be now that because these studios and rights have been bought up by so many people, they're kind of going through the depths of going, what's one of these that we can probably bash out a bit easier than some of the others, (laughs) where we can get the headline star a lot easier than we can maybe do with some of the other ones? (laughs) The plot of the first movie, made in 1984, is Axel Foley is introduced as a Detroit cop who, after the murder of his best friend, travels to California to investigate and track down the killers, whom he believes operates as an art dealership as a cover in Beverly Hills. He teams up with two reluctant detectives from the Beverly Hills Police Department, who were ordered to keep a watch on him, especially after seeing Foley's differing approach to police work tactics, considered unacceptable by the chief of police. Yeah, so there is edginess in there, definitely. Okay. And then the sequels, the synopsis for both of them starts with Axel returns to Beverly Hills. <laughs> <laughs> for plot reasons. So the first one ends with him being, my work here is done, I'm going home. And then there's two more sequels where he has to come back for increasingly contrived reasons. So he's now back for a fourth time. There will be nostalgia for this. It was popular at the time, popular enough to get two sequels. So there'll be people out there thinking, I want to see more of this. But maybe they'll watch it and then think, I didn't actually need to see any more of this. The other three were fine. I don't know enough about it to know if it was diminishing returns in the second and third one. No idea. But anyway, it's a fourth one. And it's a time-delayed sequel because that's the rage now, isn't it? Let's come back and look at something decades later because people watched it before and they'll watch it now. Nothing can ever just finish or be allowed to exist in a pocket of time where it could be considered great. How depressing. Our last thing is quite short as well. We have a first look, well, it's actually a second first look at the fifth and final season of Star Trek Discovery that involves Book and Burnham fighting some kind of creature that can turn invisible. And that's about it. My notes are, Book's punishment lasted long and (laughs) it looks great, but is this level of spectacle really necessary in Star Trek all the time? Not my only two thoughts, but those were my prevailing thoughts. I thought the cloaking phaser wasps from space were pretty cool. But yeah, it's a big spectacle. But you can imagine that would be the showboaty bit at the end of an episode or something, rather than this is the every episode occurrence of cloaking phaser wasps from space. I'm still looking forward to Discovery coming out. I'm looking forward to seeing the final season. This is just very out of context insert from an episode, isn't it? They're trying to figure out a way into something or a way to communicate with something because they're prodding rocks. There was interesting things going on with the teleport devices where they're zipping about all over the place as part of it. I'm guessing it's intent-based control. I know I want to be over there because they're not beaming up and beaming down. They're just kind of zipping about all over the place. They're magic badges. The magic badges that let you be wherever you want to be. It just knows. Artificial intelligence has got to that point now. It's (laughs) intent-based programming where it just knows that when you hit the button, you want to jump 20 feet that direction and be midair in a kick position so that you can drop kick a (laughs) fly in the face it just knows it just works i don't understand that they lost me at programmable matter (laughs) it just works don't question it it's fine it looks cool in a fight scene okay just don't ask us when we (laughs) don't use it for any other purpose okay remember in star trek it was science fiction Remember that? It's science fiction. It's absolute science fiction. But the more that you bring in technology that allows you to do anything anywhere, the less problematic any problem should be. It's the plot convenience of, oh, we've got this thing that lets us do this and it looks really cool. Okay, great. Now we've got to always write a reason why this doesn't work when something happens. (laughs) There's going to have to be a throwaway line of, oh, the dampening field in the area has made my badge that would let me get out of this prison cell or out of this situation or get us behind this assailant and them in the face it just doesn't work at the moment for reasons you need to start writing that in whereas it's always been science fiction but there's always been a slight limitation on what things can do in order to make it convenient enough for plot but also not convenient enough that everything seems that it's solvable by the technology itself immediately otherwise you've always got to constantly write a reason why it doesn't work it doesn't do this it doesn't do that there's a set of base rules in there and occasionally they can maybe twist them for just a little bit discovery with being cast so far in the future it's unlocked a lot of potential and a lot of different bits i mean discovery itself the whole concept of the jump drive the mushroom drive is something that you've got to do a lot of contrivance of and then this was never attempted ever again (laughs) 
<laughs> that's my little thing with this. But apart from that, I'm still looking forward to the season, of course. Yeah. And the technology in older Star Trek stuff, at least there was some explanation of how it worked to some degree, as in they go into the transporter room and they would say lock in coordinates and whatever, stand on the pad. Obviously that changed as it went on, but the badges that just let them teleport anywhere, it was practically a superpower. Mm. There's just no explanation of how they activate that or make it work. And that's part of the fun of Star Trek is if I had one of those, how would I work it? And it just works, apparently. It's just all intent based, mate. Everyone's night crawler now. <laughs> So why do they walk anywhere then? Ever? Yeah. We need to go to deck three that's getting the turbo lift. Why? Because the turbo lift is really huge, as we saw. The turbo lift system's massive. That's an entire other podcast. Listen to us talking about, I can't remember, was that two seasons ago? I think that was two seasons ago. Season three, it would have been. Where they absolutely broke my mind with the size of Discovery (laughs) and the turbo lift rails suddenly disappear off into a cavern. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is meant to be inside Discovery. Okay, you've lost me. It's a TARDIS. <laughs> Discovery is a TARDIS. There's no other explanation. Stay tuned for reviews of the final season of Discovery when it drops in April. And we'll probably do a podcast when it's finished as well to wrap that all up. So stay tuned for all of that. Okay, we're done with trailers. Let's move on to other stuff. We'll start with our pillars, our usual pillars of Neil Before Pod. And our first pillar will be Marvel. There's a couple of things. They have announced that there will be another animated show called Eyes of Wakanda. It doesn't really say too much about it, although there is a logline. Throughout Wakandan history, brave warriors have been tasked to travel the world, retrieving dangerous vibranium artifacts. This is their story. So it's kind of Wakandan spies going out into the world to find bits of vibranium that people have stolen or come across in their travels. Hmm. I wonder if this is replacing the Wakanda TV series that they were making at one point. Possibly. I don't know. It sounds interesting. I wonder stylistically what it'll look like. I'm trying to picture an animation style for it. Probably the same style as What If. Yeah, I guess. I can imagine an interesting short series picking up a few artifacts. I don't think it's something that would be a long runner, but... I can imagine a series of little tales of Vibranium out there and how they've managed to keep it a secret or managed to keep Wakanda a secret for as long, possibly tying it into some other historical events through the MCU and things. Maybe. I'm interested. I look forward to hearing more. It's very much, oh, this is a hint of what's to come. But that elevator pitch has me interested. I just wonder if it's replacing the show that was supposed to be set in Wakanda that may have been led by Akoi at one point. You just don't know what survived the supposed cull or uh, yeah. rechecking of information and all that stuff. Yeah, I lose track of so many different things that get announced and then a trailer finally appears. You go, oh my God, I forgot they were making that. It'll be something that we've talked about on the podcast a year ago or something. It was like, oh, there's hints that they're maybe working on a thing that's going to be this. And like, oh, that sounds like that. And then it finally comes out. You go, oh, right. <laughs> it's that one. I wonder the hit rate of some of these things where it's announced suspected project, but normally it ends up changing name. Will it be called Eyes of Wakanda by the time it comes out? Or what will it be? Or will it be retooled into something else entirely? Yeah, the bones of the idea become something else. It just gets reshaped over time, doesn't it? Speaking of retooled, they've changed the name of Spider-Man Freshman Year to Friendly Neighbourhood Spider-Man. Yeah. That makes sense to me, actually, because I think people, including myself, had assumed that it was just going to be Tom Holland's Peter Parker's origin story, but in animated form. And then some information came out about it, which suggested it was entirely different. Doctor Strange is in it and so on. Daredevil. So it's just a different take on Spider-Man's early years. So calling it Friendly Neighbourhood Spider-Man does disassociate it more with the MCU Spider-Man than previously. Because, well, I assumed that it was going to be a prequel to the Tom Holland Spider-Man based on that name. And it turns out it's not. So I can't be the only one that made that assumption. No, it's interesting. Spider-Man, it's difficult to track all the different bits that they've got going on at the moment, to be honest. Yeah. I lose track of what's what, what's canon and which universe, multiverse of madness. (laughs) <laughs> Though the disappointing thing with this Spider-Man cartoon is it's him at high school again. We just never get to see much beyond that. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. Grown up Spider-Man. We kind of get a little bit of that through the games, I guess. Yeah. The Insomniac games, that's about as close as we've come to getting a grown up Spider-Man. Well, that was a deliberate choice based on the fact that everything else seems to be high school Peter Parker and we want to do something different. Yes. And wish that they would do something like that. I don't know what your thing with that would be. Tom Holland is, well, he's not too young, really, but he looks too young. God damn him in the painting that he's got aging in the attic. 
<laughs> to get that kind of film. But yeah, it'd be good to get some of those stories in an animated universe would probably be a great way to do it. It's sort of untapped potential. So often we go back to the origin story. Batman's another example of that as well, isn't it? How many times do you need to see the Waynes killed in an alleyway? <laughs> How many times do you need to see Uncle Ben get knocked over or whatnot? Flashbacks to that. At least we've been spared that through Tom Holland's run. But... It would be good if it's slightly different. I mean, I just like Spider-Man content, let's be honest. I like seeing a bit of Spider-Man. I will be interested in this. But there's untapped potential out there. I'm glad that the Insomniac games have filled that to an extent. If other people could maybe sit there and look at it and go, oh, hang on, there is stories that could be told in this. Further in your career, more established. He's not the new guy. Definitely. And speaking of the Tom Holland Spider-Man, there is a rumour that Spider-Man 4 will be street level civil war so you'll have daredevil and kate bishop and all these characters as much as i want to see more of kate bishop and daredevil it does sound like uh spider-man's getting another film hijacked by other people it's only a rumor though stop using spider-man to loop in your own stuff (laughs) let spider-man be spider-man again People wanted him in the MCU to see him team up with the Marvel superheroes that he wasn't allowed to team up with in Sony fronted movies. And now that he's in the MCU, people are like, no, 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 <laughs> see him on his own. <laughs> My thing is, I do want him to be able to play in the whole sandbox with everyone, but I also want him to be able to have his own content. I'm greedy. I want both. <laughs> That's the thing. I don't want every Spider Man film to be he teams up with an Avenger or teams up with a another character or two or three other characters in order for results to happen because you're wanting to use Spider-Man to launch your other character that's going to go off and have a TV show or other film that you're wanting to spin off later. I would like the next Spider-Man film to be a Spider-Man film. The whole conclusion, spoilers, for the last Spider-Man film was everyone has forgotten who he is. He's not going to be teaming up or potentially is not going to be teaming up with anyone until, let's say, the end of the film. That would be great. You've opened the door there to do that story. You've got a perfect reason why he's not teaming up with X, Y and Z character and you can do a Spider-Man film. Doesn't mean you need to end it with him not interacting with anyone or someone getting involved partway through. That'd be cool. But I would like that solo film. We discussed at length. We created our own Spider-Man films (laughs) in the last podcast that we talked about Spider-Man. So I'm not going to rehash that ground completely. But yes, I do want him to be able to play in the Marvel sandbox because there's so many characters there and there's so many interesting interactions that you can have with Peter Parker and these other characters existing. We have proven through the solo films that you can get away with your character dealing with their own villain for a while and not calling on all their pals to come in and save the day. And often that choice is not explained. And I'd happily see that in a Spider-Man <laughs> film. I would probably grumble about it in the podcast and go, well, why didn't he just come up for then? But let's have that film. Let Spider-Man have a film. Let Tom Holland have a film where he's not double billing it with another A-lister. Yeah. Although I do want to see him interact with Daredevil and Kate Bishop, so... I'm torn. But make it its own thing. That's fine. You can have them interact, but do it somewhere else. (laughs) Do it the next again film. Let's just have one. Come on, Sony, Marvel, Disney, people, talk, Tom Holland, talk. Remember his thing. Anyway, that's just a rumour. So who knows what's actually going to happen. Stop teasing me with rumours, man. (laughs) I want facts on this podcast. We don't speculate. I only really delve into the rumours that seem to be the ones that are no smoke without fire. And stuff like that, it seems like, if not a certainty, it's certainly on the table. But it could be a busy film if it's the street-level civil war and the merging of the Sony universe into MCU. Oh yeah, we're going to have this street fight between Daredevil and Kate Bishop and Echo and whoever else. And oh, also, here's Venom and Morbius and Michael Keaton's back for some reason. That could be kind of strange. Yeah, the amount of plot threads that have been left hanging by not just the Spider-Man films, but everything else of little bits and pieces that they've just sort of left scattered. Yeah. And since we've started on Spider-Man, I'll jump to this one before we get to the the one we were supposed to get to next. The Spider-Man Noir live action series that we discussed a while ago is... Moving forward at Amazon, the show was first reported to be in the works at Amazon back in February. Oren Uziel is the writer on the project and will serve alongside Steve Lightfoot as co-showrunner and executive producer. As previously reported, the Untitled series will follow an older, grizzled superhero in 30s New York City. An individual with knowledge of the project says the show will be set in its own universe and the main character will not be Peter Parker. Steve Lightfoot 
previously developed and served as showrunner on The Punisher. So he's had experience of this sort of thing. Spider-Man Noir could be similar to The Punisher through a certain gaze, I suppose. We'll see. I'm not sure what to think of that, to be honest. It could be interesting. I hope they actually make him Spider-Man, though, rather than he's just a guy that dresses in a vaguely spidery costume, but... He has a gun. It's called Dave Speederman. Yeah. And he's a grizzled detective in 1930s New York. Some people call him the spider, but it's only mentioned once. Yeah, he lurks on rooftops to track down drug busts and stuff. Yeah. It sounds interesting. It's different. We often ask for, do something different. And this is different. This is going off on a character and going, oh, all right, we're going to cover that. The problem is that a lot of the stuff that they've done where they've spun off in this particular way, you've went, Oh, I wish they hadn't done that and they'd spent the money on something else. I don't know. Genuinely. This could be really interesting. It could be absolute nonsense. It's got potential. It could be really stylistic. Spider-Man Noir and the animated world and the comics themselves are really stylistic. So if you throw that in on a TV show, it's not said here, is it live action or not? It is, yeah. I'm assuming live action. So, yeah, you could do some really cool stylistic stuff with it. Yeah, but give him spider powers. But spider powers? Yeah. I want to see him sticking to walls and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those I'm conflicted. Would I rather something else? But then considering the list of stuff that Sony have announced that they're wanting to do movies for in the Spider-Man vein, this does not sound like the worst of the pickings. Well, at least the Magic Wrestler mask film is not happening anymore. Yeah, exactly. Small mercies. <laughs> Back to the MCU, the Jonathan Majors trial went ahead and he was found guilty. And the same day the verdict was rendered, Marvel sacked him. So the plans for Kang are up in the air. We don't know what they're going to plan next. We just know that it won't involve Jonathan Majors. So the options are abandon it entirely, which would be easy to do at this point. It's not the same as Thanos, where they established that Thanos was a threat in the Avengers and the post credit scene. And then the fact that he was looking for Infinity Stones was threaded throughout subsequent films. Kang has been a villain in one episode of Loki. Two episodes of Loki, sort of. He was a major villain in one episode of Loki. And then a variant of the character turned up in season two and so on. But anyway, he was only really a major threat in Ant-Man and that was dealt with. So he doesn't have to be this existential big bad that can crop up anywhere. They could just abandon it and no one will notice or care, really. Because <laughs> Loki had a small audience comparatively and nobody watched Quantumania. So it's pretty safe. Yeah. If I were Marvel, I would be absolutely tempted to rejig what your plan was for the end of this slate. Yeah. Yes, they'll absolutely get flack for changing what their plots are going to be towards the end of this. The big roadmap, the thing that was plotting out movies until 2032 or whatever it was, is going to take a bit of a beating. They're going to get a bit of negative stick for your plans are in ruins, you've messed everything up. But was anyone particularly looking forward to Kang Dynasty? Were any of us really eager for that? Well, we'd been given no reason to be eager for it because exactly. Kang hasn't really made an impression so far and there are no Avengers. The Avengers currently do not exist. Who would be teaming up to fight them? Yeah, so I can give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they were going to build up to make it an event. The work was going to be getting put in. The scaffolding was getting set out now. We've seen the ground level of the scaffolding and they were going to build towards that, maybe. But when you were looking at the slate of films and TV shows that are coming out, I'm not seeing a build up to Kang in any mm. of this. Captain America, New World Order, they're going to mention Kang in there. Probably not. What's well, Brave New World now? They changed the name of Daredevil, the TV show. Is that going to be mentioning mm. Kang? I highly doubt it. And all the other stuff. It, it didn't feel like there was going to be any connection to that in any way. Yeah, but the other films weren't specifically Thanos either. You had Infinity Stones scattered throughout. Infinity Stones were turning up all over the place and the Avengers were very much an entity in the universe that was active. So you yeah. could see how those elements would link together, whereas that's not the case now. Yeah, I can give you that. I would be tempted to redo it. The thing is, with Kangs and variants, you have absolutely the inwritten ability to go oh, he looks different now that was a minor variant this is the main variant just forget about that stadium full of them don't worry about that 
I mean, Disney have this new superpower, which is being able to edit content on Disney Plus so that <laughs> the original version is no longer available. So, except the few that have their physical media collections, like me, you can edit in whatever can you fancy into the end credits of Ant Man. They could go either way. I imagine there's very high level discussions happening at the moment of do we bin this? Is it getting the traction that we want? The problem is that binning it would add to that negative attitude that is been building to marvel for a while where people are like oh it's lost its magic it's lost its mojo it's lost its confidence it's lost its commitment this would really throw into that and they might want to just knuckle down and have commitment to their vision otherwise they're going to follow into the same trap that dc went into which is they constantly pivoted. And I think if they start to pivot now, they're going to be doing it a lot. Because that's how DC went, oh, this bit didn't work, but that bit did. Okay, right, our entire lineup is changing, our entire way of making films is changing. And they're, oh, right, that one didn't work. Right, okay, uh, this bit. And I think they have that potentially happening at Marvel. I don't think it's too late for them to make a bigger change and go, hey, this just provided an opportunity in which we could do this. If we were going to have to change this bit, we thought we might as well change in a more major way. We've analysed it, we've spoken to the fans, we know it's not working the way that we hoped or we might do Kang in the future, but we've decided that's not going to be the headliner of this slate. But if not what would be my question. Does it need to build up to something big? Maybe not. Maybe they go back to, we're just going to do a few for us sort of stories and let's not focus on building up to the event, whatever the event might end up being. I think they totally could do that. But again, people then start looking for, oh, this appeared in this bit and this bit once that. We complain that they're building up to something big and then we start looking for it. We're never going to be happy fans. I will admit, I am one of the people that will appear and go, oh, well, they're not really building up to anything, are they? After saying on this podcast, oh, maybe they should just do some individual interesting stories instead. <laughs> well, phase one through three proved they could do both, at least to some extent. I think that this would be a good point in which to change it completely anyway, because it hasn't been evident that they were building Kang up to be this massive threat that was going to be a problem that everybody needs to muck in on. They weren't doing much work on it. Most of your casual fans wouldn't even have known that it was a plan, so it's fine. And there's all these yeah. rumours about them being in talks with Mads Mikkelsen to take on a voice role, maybe, which points towards Doctor Doom, perhaps, filling that slot, which might be okay. Mads Mikkelsen, who has been in a film before, by the way, a Marvel film before. So bringing him back, but he could do a voice role. Although with Doctor Doom, I think some people are clamoring for to pick an actor with Romani heritage because that's where the character's from, that part of the world. But yeah, Doom would be a good choice. Although I like Doom being a part of this pantheon of villains, as in Doom meets Kang and wants his power and stuff like that. You could do things like that. But at the same time, there's any number of cosmic level threats that can fire a big laser at the Avengers. <laughs> Kang isn't the hill to die on. And certainly Jonathan Majors isn't the actor to die on that hill as well. No, no. And they've already sacked him, so that's fine. So yeah, recast Kang and do your plan as normal. That'd be easy enough. Pivot to another being that can fire a big laser, like I said. That's also possible. There's so many things they could do. But the problem is they need to do something. And there hasn't been an awful lot of evidence of them doing anything. No, I mean, they've got multiple reasons that they can announce changes. The big recasting, one of them. Also the fact that you can go, hey, we had a big writer strike where we weren't producing anything. So we've been able to look at the big picture stuff and stand back for a bit and look which we wouldn't have had the chance to do otherwise. We had a writing strike, we had an acting strike, and during the acting strike, we managed to resolve the writing, got the writers back and had a look at the big picture stuff and went, oh, hang on. The directors were still able to get in a room and have discussions. The studio was still able to have a look at what it had planned and go, right, okay, we think we've come up with a better course. They knew this judgment was coming. They maybe didn't know what the verdict was going to be, but they knew a judgment was going to be coming. So they will have had theoretical plans in the works. I imagine there will be some kind of announcement that everything is shuffling. They've got to do an updated roadmap anyway with all the different delays, cancellations, announcements, half announcements that they've had. So once they present all that, I think we'll have a clearer idea. Well, apparently Kang Dynasty is being referred to internally as Avengers 5 now. <laughs> yeah, I suspect it will be renamed. It might still feature Kang in some aspect, but they will take Kang out of the title. Maybe. And I think Avengers 5 and 6 will be pushed a year or so. 
as well again i think there's going to be an announcement of some other film that's going to be taking that slot and everything's going to budge a bit i think there's the potential of two different projects getting announced actually and moving stuff out of the way and we've seen it in the past where they've had the cast iron slate and then it's been like oh actually there's two films in between this and this that we totally always had planned but here's a surprise for you yeah and the thing is i was never bothered about the shuffling as such because it didn't seem to be as frequent as it was certainly on the other side of the fence so it was clear that there was still a plan even though that plan was in flux a little bit but ever since endgame it's just been well, not one disaster after another, but it's been less well-oiled, I guess, is the generous way of putting it. Hmm. We'll see. I kind of predicted this was going to happen anyway. It didn't seem like there was any scenario where Jonathan Majors got to keep his job, even if he had been found innocent. I have the feeling the film would have been retitled, even if he had been found innocent. I don't think Kang Dynasty is building up the anticipation, so I think that would be dropped as a major part of it. Well, Kang's only major appearance was in a film that barely anybody watched, so he doesn't quite carry the cachet that (laughs) they need him to. Like I say, there's potential of them doing the work to do it. We don't know what the content of all the different stuff is and what slow builds they can do in there i'm not saying that kang would be a major part in all these things but you've got the potential of dropping hints at stuff through other shows there's other hints that they've done nothing with as well like the 10 rings oh they set off a signal who's receiving that signal no idea it's kang was it kang but he was already coming another way well now there's two of them coming (laughs) because one of them was listening out for the rings sure (laughs) sounds boring but sure it was like, where's my bracelets gone? Oh, there they are. Come and get them. <laughs> so let's hop over the fence and do DC now. There is more Superman legacy casting, although it's not as much as I thought there was when I came upon this article. So Pom Clementif, who plays Mantis in Guardians of the Galaxy movies, was announced to be appearing in a role in Superman Legacy. She is not. That was made up by someone. James Gunn shot down the news saying, if I don't announce it, it's not happening. Don't accept anything about casting and DC stuff unless it comes from James Gunn directly at this point in time. However, they are going to add Miriam Shore in a role. Don't know who she's going to be, but she was the villainous recorder Vim in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So there we go. But there's no (laughs) indication of who she's playing in Superman Legacy. But we have plenty of casting for Superman Legacy at this point. It's insane. We have David Corrin Sweat as Clark Kent Superman, Rachel Brosnahan as Lois Lane, Nicholas Holt as Lex Luthor. We have casting for Green Lantern, Metamorpho, Hawk Girl, and so on. Nathan Fillion finally gets to play a Green Lantern, but not the one that you would expect. So plenty of things going on with Superman Legacy. It currently seems like a film that might actually exist, so that's exciting. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to this. Again, it's origin story stuff world building again you've got to think that they've got a bit of commitment to this time (laughs) let's see what happens let's give them the chance to build the thing for hopefully the finalist time we're going to see the origins of a universe be birthed (laughs) i look forward to seeing which more of his friends he can cast yeah we've got something about that too it'll be good i'm looking forward to superman legacy and james gunn did say something about when he was challenged on the number of characters hero characters specifically that seem to be in his superman movie and he says that he doesn't put characters in his films for the sake of cameo fodder he won't put a character in his film if he doesn't have a need for them to be there and i would perhaps challenge how successful he's been at that over in certainly the Guardians movies. Adam Warlock, did he really have a purpose in Guardians 3? It could be argued. But I do believe that he thinks the character should be there. So whether that ends up being something I agree with or not is different. But I at least know that his heart's in the right place when he says stuff like that, I suppose. Yeah, I guess so. Like you say, you can't argue that he believes the character should be there. You can only argue if you think it should have been there or not, in your opinion. I get that. It depends on the story. It depends on what their plans are for other stuff. I always get the cynical thing now in these films that you use a big character like Superman to then launch your little other films that are easier to... Oh, we'll throw eight characters at this and we'll see what the fans latch on to and that one gets a solo film. I have the feeling that happens from time to time. I'm hoping that's not the case with this. Yeah, I think what he's trying to say is that he would never put a character in just so that they can have their own solo film set up. He would have a reason for them to be in his film. It's not that they won't appear anywhere else. Absolutely. And I'm sure that there will be a plot reason for that character to exist there. The studio message at the back of that might be, and if that character works, we will be 
absolutely spinning this one off and doing that because that one's going to be easier to do than The Flash or Aquaman or Batman because all of these have currently got alarm bells triggering all around them. So let's try and do a couple of films of lesser heroes and we've launched them from our Superman platform in the meantime. I don't know. Maybe I'm being cynical and businessy about it. I (laughs) apologise. I am sure it's all coming from a place of love. You should talk to Angus's corporate stooge alter ego. (laughs) <laughs> at this point that's not his alter ego that's angus that's what he is there's also a rumor that supergirl will be appearing in superman legacy which would and wouldn't make sense depending on what kind of story they're telling but it's also heavily suggested that it will not be the actress that played her in the flash which is a shame because we'd have liked to see her again and it's not her fault that that came to a screeching halt is it no i agree with you i mean it's a shame for a lot of the dc films at the tail end that have suffered off the back of basically the announcement that listen these things aren't going anywhere which knocks a bunch of people off and then also just all the different dramas relating all the different productions i mean there was an entire film that was scrapped for tax purposes if i feel for people it's the people that didn't get a chance to even have their work show never mind that they got to appear in one thing but didn't get the six potential spin-off films that they could have got if they had been luckier. And now Warner Brothers might be merging with Paramount. That'll put interesting ripples in this whole thing. Reboot it again! Reboot (laughs) it again! The Paramount exec is, my condition for this merger is you sack James Gunn. (laughs) My condition is I want our people to vet James Gunn's work. Yeah. The merger sounds like an absolute nightmare in terms of variety of stuff that you're going to get out there, but it'd be great for Paramount slash whichever streaming service ends up being the flagship streaming service when the dust settles it will be a bigger content bin for whoever that is or whatever one that is so if that ends up being paramount plus then great it's got a ton of stuff if it ends up being max then again great it's got an extra ton of stuff that you can add on there who knows i don't know but it also means that warner brothers slash paramount will have control of so many franchises as well and it's crazy there will just be a couple of monoliths we give all our money to in about 10 years. It'll be great because we'll be back down to like two streaming services. No, they'll end up with sub packages. Mate. <laughs> have you not heard? Sub packages. Oh, you want the Marvel stuff? That's an additional $3. We have the Marvel streaming service. <laughs> Yeah, it's all part of the one package, but then there's additional add-on channels. Remember the good old days of cable and satellite (laughs) subscription TV, where you had to add on additional packages in order to watch all the channels. Well... And it's all ad-supported, unless you're willing to pay to not be ad-supported. Yes. Also, you can only have one thing in your watch list, and to get rid of it is a dollar. (laughs) What if I finish watching it? Nope. No, it's there for life, mate. It's done. And don't just fast-forward it until you reach the end. We can tell. We'll rewind it on your behalf because you've obviously done that by accident. And if you switch it on and leave the room, we'll also know. (laughs) If you leave during the adverts, we'll pause them. (laughs) Oh, Jesus. Well, Spotify do that, don't they? If you have the ad version of Spotify and if you turn the volume down on your headphones. If you mute it. Yeah, yeah, it'll pause the advert. Yeah. It'll be like if you get up to make a cup of tea, the channel just pauses, <laughs> waits for you to come back. You have to install this camera when you get our streaming service. It's a facial verification to make sure that you're not sharing your account. I think you'll find it's how we've got to clamp down on sharing. I'm giving them too many ideas. You need to edit this out. This is just 1984, basically. It's just bad. It's bad. It's dystopian. It's dystopian, <laughs> mate. Anyway, we're still on DC and you were talking about James Gunn's mates. Well, this isn't his mates, it's his family member, his brother. Sean Gunn is possibly going to be playing the DC villain Discount Lex Luthor, Maxwell Lord. The role was previously played by Pedro Pascal in Wonder Woman 1984. Remember that? Uh, Yeah, that's who that guy was. He's also appeared in the Arrowverse a couple of times. Like I say, he's a Discount Lex Luthor. He's another billionaire that is also evil. But Sean Gunn's going to do it. And it's quite funny, there was a tweet from Zachary Levi where he said, yeah, I guess he can cast his brother and stuff. I don't know whether he's bitter about it or just joking. Either way, it was quite funny. It's not unexpected that James Gunn will make sure his brother gets a decent paycheck. He does all the mocap for a bunch of CGI creatures, like Weasel and stuff like that. And he's Rocket when on set in the Guardians movies. He's done a lot of different bits and pieces, Sean Gunn. I think it's a bit cruel to be going, oh, he's just casting his pals. I kind of say it's a bit of a jokey thing, but... But also, that's exactly what he's doing. If I was running DC, mate, I'd give you a part. (laughs) <laughs> I'd let you get a little walk-on role. I'm a nice guy like that. He's going to play Maxwell Lord. They've not really said where Maxwell Lord's going to be appearing yet. Maybe in Superman. Presumably in some way in Superman. Maybe not in a big bit, but teasing something coming later. Presumably. 
He could have one scene where him and Lex Luthor have a meeting. Yeah. It seems like you would announce that in order to explain why he's on set and things, and that's why you would need to announce it up front. Like you say, Sean Gunn does a lot of mocap and things. It wouldn't surprise me if he's mocapping some stuff in Superman and then as a nod is getting a live action part in it similar to Guardians where he did a lot of mocap but had an on-screen presence. It wasn't the hugest on-screen presence, but he had it. Well, it was bigger in the second and third film. Yeah, yeah, it was bigger in the, the other two. I, I absolutely will give you that. It might be along those lines. Who knows? That's a thing that's happening. Well, we're out of their pillars now and on to just some miscellaneous stuff. Remember the Ocean's Eleven prequel that was announced ages ago? No. Well, we have some more news on it. The casting was announced a while ago as well. I don't know whether I missed it or forgot it. Either way, Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling are going to be in it, which is a Barbie reunion because they were both in that, remember. They are going to be playing the parents of George Clooney's character in the Ocean's Eleven prequel. Also the Sandra Bullock character, because in Ocean's 8, she was George Clooney's Danny Ocean's sister. So she'll be there too. Obviously not Sandra Bullock, or maybe it will be some really creative de-aging going on for those two. Those two are going to be the parents of these two characters anyway. And George Clooney had something to say about it. He said, Margot Robbie's my mother. I've always thought that. And Ryan Gosling is my father. And when you think about that, it makes sense. That's all I said. Jay Roach is set to direct a prequel with Carrie Solomon writing. The new prequel is expected to take place in 1960s Europe. Ocean's 8, the latest film in the franchise, came out in 2018, starring Sandra Bullock. There we go. The Ocean's Eleven prequel is going to be Danny Ocean's parents and it'll be Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling playing them, which already has my attention. A heist movie with them two in the lead? Absolutely. I was today's years old when I learned that there was an Ocean's 8. It was okay, actually. Anne Hathaway was in it, Sandra Bullock, others. Yeah, I'm interested in this. I like the two of them working together. The Ocean's movies are fun. I have not seen all of them, considering that Number eight passed me by. So yes, I'm for this. That has the potential to be fun. And because it's set in the past, that gives it a edge, gives it a little different flavor, can make it retro. Ironically, it'll be a bit more like the original Ocean's Eleven. Mm. I've seen Ocean's Eleven and Twelve, but I didn't watch Thirteen because after the Julia Roberts character was involved in a plan because she looks like real life Julia Roberts, I was out. That was just the stupidest twist. Was that too much? Was that just too far? Yeah. If you want to say that she looks like an actress, just invent an actress for the film. Have her on the cover of magazines or billboards or whatever, but no, no, real life Julia Roberts. And oh, Bruce Willis is here too. So I never watched 13. After 12, I was like, nah, it's too stupid. That's it. I'm done. I'm done. I'm out. (laughs) We all have lines that we draw and this is where I've drawn mine. But 11's really good. It's got the, the meme of Brad Pitt's eating in every single scene. Okay. He's always chewing chewing gum or eating something in every scene that he's in. Something to watch out for. I guess I must be doing Ocean's Eleven rewatch. I'll wait until this one's about to come out, I guess. But great cast on this and who they're playing. Fair enough. Family business is heists, apparently. <laughs> Disappointed in the family member that decides to go into, I don't know, finance scams instead or something. <laughs> you know, something a lot easier to make a lot of money out of without getting arrested. It seems that there could be less effort with more money being made. Is all I'm saying. Let's move on to our next thing. Just before the holiday break, Universal Pictures found an exciting package under its tree. Sources tell Deadline that the studio has landed rights to the Christmas comedy Naughty, which has Olivia Wilde directing and Lucky Chap producing. The package is based on a spec by Cocaine Bear scribe Jimmy Warden, and the auction saw several studios in the mix with Universal ultimately winning, delivering the winning bid. Margot Robbie, Tom Ackerley and Josie McNamara are producing. Described as Bridesmaids in the North Pole, the film follows Mallory, whose only hope of securing custody of her son from her gaslighting trash bag ex is to find Santa Claus and convince him to testify in her divorce hearing. Okay. That was the elevator pitch bit that got me going, okay, there might be something in this. (laughs) (laughs) Bridesmaids in the North Pole. Yeah. But trying to get Santa Claus to testify to being on the naughty list or whatnot. Okay. Why not? But if the behind the scenes can be as fun as the don't worry darling nonsense, then it could be extra exciting. (laughs) An interesting idea. Olivia Wilde's generally good. I didn't like Don't Worry Darling that much. I thought it was a bit messy, but 
this looks like it could be fun. The next bit of news is to make you feel even worse if you've spent any time being lazy. 80 odd year old man Ridley Scott is directing another film. He just cannot stop, apparently. He just doesn't want to ever slow down and just enjoy being old and rich. He is going to be directing an adaptation of the short story Bomb, an action thriller with franchise potential. The short story is a template for an action thriller in the vein of Dog Day Afternoon and Speed. Frankie Ippolito is a hostage negotiator called into duty the night before his wedding in London. A man who has parked himself in a construction site in Piccadilly Circus is standing on a newly uncovered unexploded bomb from World War II. Didn't that actually happen? happened recently. He tells local law enforcement he will only speak with Frankie and this sets off a chain of events in which Frankie is drawn into an overnight struggle to stop the bomber with whom he has a past. I'm sure the unexploded World War II bomb thing happened recently in real life. They wash up all the time. Yeah, Ridley Scott doing more stuff. Yeah, because he's on so many different projects and stuff. It has the reek of something that will go to another director and then be renamed something completely different. Nah, I think Ridley Scott is efficient enough to just get this done. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's one that can be bashed out a lot quicker than some of the others while the effects are getting done on something else. Bomb gets shot and done, yeah. Well, it's in his best interest to be efficient because he old. <laughs> That's not being ageist, he just is. He's he's an old man. You gotta be efficient, Ridley. You can't be hanging about anymore, man. I mean, he is efficient. You see how quickly he churns these things out. Yeah. Nuts. And some of them are good. <laughs> I don't think Ridley Scott's hit rate, especially lately, is particularly high. I didn't see Napoleon yet, but some of his stuff are duds. For every Martian, there's the counsellor. But it sounds like an interesting idea. It kind of reminds me of the taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, which, oddly enough, his brother directed the remake. Just a hostage negotiator talking to someone. Well, it's a negotiation type thing. So the meat of the film will be in the conversations between the two leads, I'm guessing. Mm. Will it be his next hit or will it bomb? I'm not giving you points for that one. <laughs> I've been thinking about that ever since I saw the story, and I'm not even getting credit for it. No, nah, that means you've thought about it too long. I prefer the natural, accidental ones. <laughs> you get minus points for putting thought into it. Okay, let's move on. We have another video game adaptation, this time Death Stranding, which is a game I haven't played, but I know enough about. Hideo Kojima's Kojima Productions has partnered with Alex Leb of Vici's Hammerstone Studios develop and produce a film adaptation of the popular hit video game Death Stranding. Death Stranding is, I think it's best described as a walking simulator. You spend a lot of time just walking from place to place, just taking in the world and there's a story around it. And Norman Reedus is in the game, so I wonder if he'll be in the film, because it's his likeness that's in the game as well. Maybe. Have you played Death Stranding or seen anyone play it? I haven't. I've seen some footage of it and stuff, but no, I've not played any of it. Maybe I'll look at it after this. It sounds interesting, but like you say, if it's a bit of walking simulator thing, maybe not. I do like a bit of story, a bit of lore in a game though. It will be a shame if this Death Stranding film gets made before Metal Gear Solid gets made, considering that's been around for way longer. But anyway, yeah, so that's happening. I haven't played it. I wasn't interested enough to pay full price for it, and then I just haven't been interested enough to look at it ever since. One day, maybe. Mm. Okay, let's move on. Bradley Cooper and Christian Bale spy package Best of Enemies lands at Amazon after a massive bidding battle. <laughs> the film is based on the book Best of Enemies, the last great spy story of the Cold War by Eric Desenhall and Gus Russo. The book tells the story of a CIA agent, Jack Platt, who will be played by Cooper, and KGB agent Gennady Vasilenko, played by Christian Bale. Oh, good, Christian Bale doing a Russian accent. Fantastic. A pair of Cold War spies who developed an unlikely friendship at a time where they could have been anything but. They were new entrants to the DC intelligence scene back in 1978, with the former working out of CIA's counterintelligence office with the latter out the Soviet embassy. Remarkably, they came to establish strong personal ties, even after each was sent to seduce the other into betraying their country. The pair were involved with solving some of the most famous spy stories of the 20th century, including the rooting out of Soviet mole Robert Hansen, while Vasilenko spelt some time in Soviet prison after it came to the government's attention that had been working as a double agent for the US. He ultimately was freed with help from the CIA during the spy swap of 2010. Among other advocates during this period of incarceration were none other American hustles, Robert De Niro. Wow. Sounds interesting. It kind of sounds a bit like the man from UNCLE, in a way. It does a little bit. Although these were real people. Yeah, spies forming friendships. Again, it's another one of these ones where I'm like, maybe the real story is going to be more interesting to read about than the film. I kind of want to hear about the true events of it, as much as I imagine a dramatic retelling of it will be pretty interesting. 
it kind of makes you want to read up about the real people, the real stories, because that just sounds fascinating, how that comes to be, where one gets enticed by the other. I am interested in that. Let's see what happens to it when it comes out. Yeah, Bradley Cooper and Christian Bale bouncing off each other might just be fun by itself. They tend to be good in whatever they're in, usually. Next up is Daniel Craig and Charlize Theron join forces for Two for the Money at Apple Fast 9 filmmaker Justin Lin to direct, or Star Trek Beyond filmmaker Justin Lin to direct. If I just want to use the baseline of a film I actually liked to help <laughs> excite me about this. The film is based on the original idea by Lin and Dan Mazou, who did Fast X. So, oh God, it's a collaboration between two fast people. But it's an original idea, which you don't see an awful lot of, so that's good. Theron and Craig will play career thieves whose relationship spans the course of three big jobs. And it's an original idea, but it doesn't really say much more than that. So they're just thieves that do three things, I guess. And it's about yeah. their back and forth. They'll be interesting. Is it one of them not quite trusting each other, one of them trusting each other, then one where there's curse your inevitable betrayal? I thought we were closer than this towards the end. Or Bonnie and Clyde mm. type scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they work the first job together, fall in love, then start working jobs together. Could be. Again, it's two actors that I like, so cool. And a director that I've seen a film of his that I liked as well. Yeah. Star Trek Beyond was good. The fast movies, we know what I think of those. Not much. <laughs> this sounds interesting. It's obviously got a lot of attention because it's another one of these sort of bidding war type ones, isn't it? Yeah, there's an awful lot of these. Yeah, I mean, there's not that many places that could release those kind of films anymore, so they all seem to be fighting for the same content. It's going to be harder when people are trying to pitch these films when there's only one studio. We'll give yeah. you $10 and you'll take it. <laughs> That's the problem with monopolies. Creatives can't make as much money out of them Yeah, because they can't play them against each other. It's one problem with monopolies. It's not the only problem. But we'll see how this pans out. Bonnie and Clyde, thieves that don't trust each other, could go a few ways. Next up, Paul Greengrass has been hired to adapt the big screen version of T.J. Newman's novel, Drowning, The Rescue of Flight 1421. Again, the studio emerged victorious earlier this year in a bidding war, one that drew interest in the likes of Nicole Kidman, Alfonso Cuaron and Steven Spielberg, along with seven-figure offers from Apple and Bruckheimer, Paramount and Damien Chazelle, legendary Universal Television. So everybody wanted this for some reason. It centres on a play that crashes into the Pacific Ocean six minutes after takeoff and then sinks to the bottom of the ocean and is attacked by sharks. No, that's not the next bit. During the evacuation, an engine explodes and the plane is flooded. Those still alive are forced to close the doors, but it's too late. I oh, know it is. The plane sinks to the bottom with 12 passengers trapped inside. Among them is an engineer and his 11-year-old daughter. His estranged wife, she's also the girl's mother, is part of the elite rescue team that races to save the passengers before their air runs out. The film has not been cast yet. They already made this. So you know earlier on when I said there was a film like this that does not include sharks, I present to you Drowning. <laughs> <laughs> it's the exact same film, minus angry sharks. It doesn't say they're sharks here, but it's a possibility. They might add them in in post. Why not have electrified eels? Angry whales? I don't know. Just to add a bit of variety. But yeah, pretty much they've announced the release of a film which is already made and getting released and has a trailer. And everyone's had a bidding war for it. Yeah, there was a massive bidding war when it was made on the cheap with Chief O'Brien. Huge bidding war for the film that's already made. Oh, wow. I don't understand. I don't get it. I imagine that the guy that came back and won the rights after the bidding war was really, really happy with himself until he noticed the trailer for that other film. <laughs> and then went, oh, darn, right. Don't tell the boss. Don't tell the boss. Get the press release out quick that we've got this great film, okay? I'm getting my bonus and I'm getting out of here before he finds out. Wow, I'm so fired. I am so fired when my boss sees that trailer. <laughs> Oh, wow, you managed to get our film out really, really quick. Well done. That's like a fast turnaround. Like, yeah, yeah, that is our film, isn't it? Yeah. Although, being serious, I expect that the No Way Up one will be at best considered, this was fun schlock, whereas this is a Greengrass film, so it might be seen as a bit more prestigious. Although, again, I don't think he's a surefire hit either. He did Captain Phillips and Bourne films and so on, so it's decent pedigree. You're getting the mix where the wife of the people that are on the plane is also going to be part of the rescue team, yeah. so you're going to get both sides of it. I imagine No Way Up is going to more focus on the people on the plane and the water and the sharks and the drama down there rather than the dramatic rescue of the people from below. He's an engineer so you're going to get some cool ways of managing to keep them alive for a bit longer. I mean, this one's just minus sharks, not even with freaking laser beams on their heads. I imagine it'll have some cachet and it's obviously got something for all those studios to be 
bidding. Maybe they were all bidding because they were like, this will be cheap to film. We've got to have one set submerged in water. And it turns out there's one already on the back lot. <laughs> I guess it's interest in the novel that sparked the bidding war for this. Yes. It's obviously had a good reception and they've went for it. Yeah. See, that's one of those beautiful moments where I don't read the entire synopsis before I put these on the news agenda. Did you not wonder why I was teasing something coming up later on? <laughs> no, I forgot all about it, to be okay. honest. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, when you said it about sharks, I think at the time I thought, I can't think of anything else that has sharks in it that's on this list. Oh, maybe I've forgotten about it. Well, exactly. It doesn't have mother... Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll see the Chief O'Brien version, then we'll see this version later, I guess. So that's something. <laughs> It'll be one of those things that they'll come out... Of the- well, they can't, because No Way Up's coming out like next year <laughs> or this year depending when you're listening to this, whereas this hasn't even been cast yet. But it would be funny if they came out the same summer. Like happens sometimes, the two White House invasion movies are out the same summer and so on. Yeah, one tries to race to get out before the other, but I think that race has definitely been won already, hasn't it? Yeah, but I don't think the reach on the Chief O'Brien one will be quite the same. Mm. Maybe. Maybe. It might be great. Who knows? Find out. Yeah, more depth on drowning. (laughs) Moving on. Christopher Landon has exited Scream 7. He announced on social media, I guess now is as good a time as any to announce I formally exited Scream 7 weeks ago. Landon shared on X slash Twitter, the social media platform. This will disappoint some and delight others. It was a dream job that turned in a nightmare and my heart did break for everyone involved. Everyone, but it's time to move on. He continued, I have nothing more to add in the conversation other than I hope Wes's legacy thrives and lifts above the din of a divided world. What he and Kevin created is something amazing and I was honoured to have even the briefest moment basking in their glow. Talked about last month how Melissa Barrera was fired because she made some social media posts about how genocide is bad. And apparently that's enough to get her fired. Jenna Ortega left the film as well. It was said that it's scheduling conflicts with Wednesday, but that sounds like a cover up for the fact that she left in protest and talked about it last month. But I reckon the Jenna Ortega thing doesn't really impact her career negatively to walk away from something like this because the offers are piling up for her at the moment. So it's really easy for her to walk away from stuff. Not that that would diminish any statement made by the fact that she doesn't support it and and leaves. But it's a bit like with Tom Holland as well, him talking about he's not going to play Spider-Man again unless they do a story that he feels is worth telling. You're in a privileged position to be able to do that, whereas a lot of actors wouldn't be. I know, it's just interesting to see how the mechanism works. But the Melissa Barrera thing, it's terrible that they fired her for those statements because she wasn't saying anything awful, really. I mean, awful to some people, I guess, but it's not a good look. And now the director's gone, so I feel like they should just bin this film. It's gone. No element of what you were doing before exists. Maybe it's time it just lets Scream lie fallow for a few years again while the dust settles. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the Scream franchise. They can do whatever they want with it. I don't care. Every once in a while, one of these things gets announced and some of them get made and I look at them and go, nope, and then I move on with my life. It is worrying that people can put up thoughtful opinions about stuff and then lose their job as a result of it, though. One of Melissa Barrera's points on the matter was, this isn't really fair because you'll be making films about this in 10 years. It's just a mess. And I think it's probably best that the Scream franchise just goes away for a while. They had a good thing going with five and six and now kind of ruined it by making that decision. It's a bit like the James Gunn decision that ultimately got reversed. There was no need for you to do this, but it happened. So there you go. We'll see what they do next. There was also already controversy around the fact that they didn't want to give Neve Campbell the money that she deserves to be in Scream 6. So I wonder if they'll <laughs> start going down that route again for Scream 7. Let's get all the old people back and we'll try and pay them what they're worth this time. But it's never good to hear about these things. When people get treated so badly by effectively employers. Anyway, moving on. Lionsgate has picked up the rights to the 1979 dystopian, here we go again, novel with Francis Lawrence in Final Talks to Direct. And the novel is The Long Walk a Stephen King novel. New Line was previously developing the project before the rights lapsed in the summer of 2022. Now Lionsgate will begin anew with their own take. The Long Walk centres on an annual contest in which 100 teen boys embark on the punishing titular journey that involves strict stipulations. They must walk at least four miles an hour and ends with only one survivor. Over the years, filmmakers George A. Romero and Frank Darabont eyed the project. The book's influence can be felt in later works, including The Hunger Games. This makes Lawrence an appropriate fit, I guess. I don't know much about this. I haven't read a lot of Stephen King stuff, but it seems bleak enough for the current slate of Hollywood, isn't it? Yeah, if you need a bit of dystopia. Likewise, I have not read this, but it sounds interesting, actually. So it might be one of those ones that I now pick up. It's how you make the, they have to walk four miles an hour until all of them but one die. Interesting, I guess. That's what happens on the journey, I guess, isn't it? (laughs) It's your Hungry Games 
sort of thing. It's stand by me with a death sentence. That's what it is. Don't stand by me. Walk by me. Keep walking. Keep walking by me. Keeping a pace of four miles an hour for a long time, though, that would be a challenge. That's a lot. Yeah. But there we go. It's happening and Francis Lawrence is going to direct it. Goody. Moving on, Benny Safdie is going to be directing The Smashing Machine, which is going to be starring The Rock. It's about MMA and UFC champion Martin Kerr. The film marks The Rock's move into his most dramatic project and role yet. The Smashing Machine is a drama based on the story of Mark Kerr, the legendary MMA fighter from the no-holds-barred era of the UFC at the peak of his career. He struggles with addiction, winning, love and friendship in the year 2000. Kerr was a two-time UFC heavyweight tournament champion and World Vale Tudo Championship tournament winner. Over the course of his career, he won over two dozen MMA titles. In 2003, Kerr was a subject of the HBO documentary, also titled The Smashing Machine. So the question on this is, can The Rock act? Well, according to A24, the film marks The Rock's move into his most dramatic project and role yet. He has done dramatic roles before. He has fallen into this, I'm just going to play myself thing. But we've all heard the stories about his divaism when he's on films and what he will and won't do and things like that. But maybe he's woken up to the fact that what he was trying to do isn't working for him anymore. So he has to move into something else and maybe try and prove that he's actually a good actor. But the problem with whenever I see The Rock in something, I can't see him as the character. I always just see him as The Rock. I don't know if he has the chops to pull this off. I don't know. I, I think he has the potential to do it, but he's got to want to do it. If you get the right motivation and everything behind you, then I, I imagine he could. But we're essentially looking at the press release saying they're going to do the thing. I think the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Looking at pictures of Mark Kerr, he looks enough like The Rock for The Rock to at least embody the wrong. Yeah, he was immersed in that sort of world himself to an extent. Yeah. So I think it's definitely possible. He'd be drawing a lot from his own experience in there as well. Let's see what the trailers look like, what the film is like. At the moment, it's just usual press release gubbins. And he has done films where he has been impressive enough as an actor in ways that aren't the sort of stuff he does now. I can't remember what it was called, but there was a film where he played some guy that had a steel plate in his head. He has done a couple of things, but it's just he's sunk into that sort of bland action persona. The Jumanji guy or the Fast and Furious guy or the other forgettable action movies where he's played himself. So, like I say, I don't know if he has the chops to pull this off, but we'll see. It's interesting that he's heading in this route, though, because I guess he was trying to get a franchise that he could stick his mitts into and that would keep him in jobs for a while. I think that's what Black Adam was supposed to be, and then that didn't pan out. So if he wants to stay relevant, he has to change track completely because whatever he's doing isn't working. He can try and sell you his aftershave or whatever it is he tries to sell you at the same time. <laughs> was there not something a Red Notice that was just one of his products was sponsoring the film? Was it not that they had their own branded drinks in there? Was it not Aviator Gin and the tequila for Reynolds and Rock, I think? Something like that. Can't remember. Is, he does. Maybe this is what he needs. I'm sick of the Rock shtick, really. Tell that to his face. Dare you. <laughs> like I'd be stupid enough to do that. <laughs> it's like when he turned up at the test screenings of Black Adam. Yeah, you're going to get an honest response out of the audience. Maybe that was calculated. That's how he got his positive responses to the film. He just showed up at test screenings. So guys, what did you think? Yeah, best film ever. Giant man. <laughs> no notes. Perfect. Please don't break my face. No, please take me out of this headlock. <laughs> we'll revisit this when more is known, I suppose. For our last item, I thought we'd go not quite dystopian, but... Kind of depressing. Last month, it was announced that Sebastian Stan was going to be playing a young Donald Trump in a movie called The Apprentice. And now there's a picture of him as Donald Trump. And quite a transformation, actually, for Sebastian Stan. Mm. They pulled it off somehow. I don't know how. I made the joke last month that it was Donald Trump getting a film about his life pitched to him. And it's, yeah, so we've picked an actor. We think it looks exactly like you. It's Sebastian Stan. Known handsome actor, Sebastian Stan. We think that's you, as a younger man. Yeah, please approve this now. We've cast this guy. I thought when you messaged this over, this was a last minute edition to let listeners peek behind the curtain because you know you love it. This was a last minute edition and I thought Craig was taking the mickey. <laughs> Did you think it was some kind of AI deep fake or something? I thought it was one of those fake links where you get rickrolled when you click it. <laughs> well, you save the picture and it will be linked in the show notes I imagine looks convincing enough I question why this film is in fact a thing going into the year 2024 when there's going to be an election going on <laughs> but sure good choice 
people of the world. Let's commission one of those. The thing I question about this is, obviously, it would have to be done with Trump's permission. And he's not going to sign off on anything that makes him look bad, is he? I mean, maybe he doesn't care because people love him anyway. Don't know. Enough of it is probably arm's length enough to be like, oh, it's all the bits he likes will be true. The bits he doesn't like will not be true. Yeah. It will be pitched as all the business success that's shown is true. But the way I got the business success in the film is exaggerated or this is wrong or that's wrong there's stuff there from ivanka trump the first wife and stuff as well the less i think about donald trump the happier my life (laughs) is but unfortunately i don't get my way it was announced around the same time as a biopic for elon musk was announced you're just baiting me into a rage now aren't you? (laughs) you're gonna follow up with the boris johnson biopic just to really set me off we already had the boris one kenneth branagh this england that was on last year yeah. So that's the trifecta. We've got it. Yeah, brilliant. The Elon Musk one is based on a biography that was released last year that no doubt would have been authorised by him, so it's not going to have any truth in it. I'll be sceptical about the truth that this will have. The Apprentice film, it says, will examine Trump's efforts to build his real estate business in New York in the 70s and 80s, also digging into his relationship with infamous attorney Roy Cohn, who will be played by Mark Strong. It's a mentor-protege story that charts the origins of a major American dynasty filled with larger-than-life characters. No kidding. It reveals the moral and human cost of a culture defined by winners and losers. Sources tell Deadline that Strong will play con with Maria Bakalova, Trump's first wife, Ivana. It's billed as an exploration of power and ambition set in a world of corruption and deceit. Again, no kidding. It gives me the ick. It gives me acid reflux. It's such a curiosity to see how that'll pan out and why Sebastian Stan would end up doing it because, well, this is going to be divisive. He's going to have to live in a bunker for 10 years after it's released. As an actor, I can almost get the detachment of I am playing what is on the page. I'm playing a character like any other character. There is something in it. The less attention, the happier I am. But 2024 is going to be a big year for former president, so... This will probably be the most minor thing about Trump that we see over the next 12 months. Doesn't say when it's due out. I would get it out quick because it may be getting looked back on slightly differently come 12 months' time. (laughs) Let's see. It might be outlawed by a sitting president by the time the film comes out. (laughs) Ends up being this bootleg thing that gets shared in the darkest recesses of the internet. (laughs) You think there'll still be an internet, bless you. (laughs) It's compelling that we're getting biopics on Trump and Musk specifically because they are obviously important global figures in the world we live in now. But it's also strange to be having the story coming out while it's still being told. It's not that we're doing a biopic about someone who's dead or someone who's just retired and doesn't do anything interesting anymore. You know, like Priscilla Presley, for example, she signed off on a biopic of her early life or a certain stage in her life. I haven't seen the film, but it's not a birth to death thing specifically, but there's enough distance from that time in her life that it almost makes sense to tell that story. Whereas with Trump and Musk, it's still going on. Yes and no. I mean, this is very much focusing on the early career. So you're kind of following the same rules, similar with... Musk, you can cover his early business dealings and the things that he did there that people may not have known about and give interpretations of events through the people that have been willing to talk to you to form the material or form the biography. I think there is some distance there with these characters, but it depends on portrayal. It depends on how you write these figures. You're either doing the meteoric historic rise of this heroic person that triumphed against adversity to get the business to the size that it was, blah, blah, blah. Or you're telling the tale of someone that did interesting dealings to get to the position that they are. There's ways that you can spin stories through film. And that is what I don't particularly like about these films about figures that are still very influential. Yeah, the spin is what worries me. The spin is the angle that I don't like on this because there is still a lot to play for in the case of those two individuals where there maybe isn't for Priscilla Presley. Like you say, her career is kind of done as much as still being an influential figure in a different kind of way. There's nothing to be gained from the way something is portrayed to members of the public. Whereas for Donald Trump, like I've said already, there's a potential that he will be standing for president at the same time as this comes out. Potentially. I think it will take longer than that, though, because they've only just started it filming-wise. Yeah. And similar with 
musk if different things are going on at the same time as it coming out. I find it fascinating that these choices have been made, but I would rather that they weren't. I would rather (laughs) read the biography and come up with your own conclusions on the back of that source material rather than whatever conclusions, good or bad, that the filmmakers may have come to. Or may have been coerced into making. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to allocate any of that. But yeah, <laughs> whatever reading they have had of that material when they have made the content, I would say. One thing that comes to mind is in Bohemian Rhapsody because the surviving members of Queen had input into that film. When you watch Bohemian Rhapsody, it makes it look like Freddie Mercury is this mess of a person that was on drugs and stuff like that. But none of the other members of Queen did anything like that. They were perfectly clean and wholesome. And it left out the fact that Brian May released solo music before Freddie Mercury did and things like that. So there was definite we want to not make ourselves look bad by being involved in this film. I mean, there was lots of issues with Bohemian Rhapsody all over the place, but that was certainly one of them. The idea that there's clearly some revisionist history going on here, Mm. which is what happens when you get people that were involved in the story telling the story. You can't really avoid that, but there just seemed to have been an effort to cut out certain truths, I suppose. It's interesting because it can become that that is the history that gets remembered because it's been visualised in that way and they go, no, 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 I I saw it in a film so that's the way it was. Yeah, people watch the film and believe it because they can't be arsed to fact check. Some people would assume watching a film that the film has been fact checked because it's a film. It's an official film so it's fact checked. But like you say, there can be certain things that are left out or merely hinted at rather than fully written out and I think it would be impossible to fact check everything that you watch every biopic or every we've already talked about it in this podcast earlier on based on true events characters in the story may be true but some actions may be different the disclaimer that pops up at the end of films going you know any resemblance to anyone living or dead is merely consequential it wasn't done on purpose there's a lot of that sort of hand wavy on things for dramatic purposes sequences may have been shortened or lengthened for dramatic purposes or any of that sort of stuff can happen and fact checking is well it's almost a way of life that you've got to live now with social media and everything else and films it's just because of my personal feelings on those people i maybe do not want this as much as some other things and that is for me to deal with and other people might be right up for this content we'll see how it goes be interested to see the trailer to see what his trump impression is like how he does the voice i think in his interpretation he should do a geordie accent <laughs> well whatever works but anyway that's us december 2023 all the news there wasn't anything else announced at all no more trailers either that was it everything here is the definitive list of december 2023's releases and you can fact check by yourself to find out if i'm accurate or not chris thanks for joining for the december roundup the final roundup of the year you're welcome I would like to thank Neil Stenson for the supplied music. And if you like what you heard, you can hit that subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcasts, really. It will likely be on the feed. Most of these places have a rating system in place that usually uses stars in order to allow you to rate. So, Chris, tell the listeners how many stars we're looking for. I would take an arbitrary five stars. Five stars suits me fine, yes. And a comment. And also, there's a donate button on neilbeforeblog.co.uk where you can donate a couple of quid to us if you so desire. If you want to discuss anything we discussed here or anything else, you can get us on Facebook or Twitter slash X under neilbeforeblog or you can leave a comment under neilbeforeblog.co.uk. Also click that donate button if you want. Join our Discord. Join our Discord. You can do that too. We have a small yet engaged community where we talk about stuff so you can hit us up there if you want to. For more monthly news podcasts, interviews, in-depth analysis about your favourite nerdy things, you can catch us next time and other times on Neil Before Pot. (laughs) 